Your discretion is advised. Hello everybody and welcome to this Sunset Safari with Safari Love. I am Stefan Winterboer. This is brought to you from the Mara in Kenya and South Africa's Kruger National Park. And we'll see you in a little bit with those elephants. This is Safari Live. Goodness me, I don't quite know what happened with that introduction. It's obviously a bit out of practice. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to have you all back. We've had a fantastic day. We expected it to get a bit cloudy. We were actually expecting some rain and it hasn't quite clouded up, but it has definitely got enough cloud cover that when it gets a bit darker, there's a good chance that it does rain over. Now, we're with this herd of elephant. It's a small herd of elephant. They're moving south. And it looks like they've been hanging around this thick bush area to get some shade. It's been a fairly warm day, nothing too hectic. And we've got this young female and her calf walking at the back of the group. She's just keeping a wary eye on me and that's why I stopped the vehicle. Elephants you've always got to be very careful of. There are times when you get close to elephant, there are also times when you need to stay far away from them. And have a look at that sky. Isn't that just beautiful? The wind has been blowing the whole day. And we haven't really heard anything about what's going on in the bush today. It's been quiet. There's, there's this expectancy that everybody's feeling at the moment, the sort of calm before the storm. And it's evident in these alleys. I think it's the change of the season. Uh, remember that um, this is a live show, which means you're watching this as it happens, but it is also an interactive show. And uh, using Twitter and YouTube, you are welcome to ask me some questions and we will answer them between myself and my colleagues, which are coming out of the Mara Triangle Game Reserve in Kenya, three and a half thousand miles north of here. We'll try and answer as many of your questions as what we can. Now here's a young bull. He is probably associated to this herd, although it's tough to say. This time of the year, the Sabi Sands, which is where we are right now in the Kruger National Park of South Africa, has an influx of elephant. They go from about 400 odd elephant to about 800 odd elephant in this uh, 64,000 hectare reserve. And so it's difficult to say if this is just a teenager from this group in front of us or whether or not he is a lone male. Anywhere from about 16 or 14 to about or anywhere up to about 25 years old, I suppose, elephants become, elephant bulls become nomadic and they become loners. And they do this so that by the time they're around about 35 and are now sexually mature and are able to vie for the attentions of females, that they are hopefully far out of their natal home range and therefore won't be, uh, won't be able to mate with their, their moms and their sisters and their cousins. And just to prove one of Mother Nature's fantastic ways of preventing inbreeding. Let's go forward a little bit and have a look at him. I like seeing male elephant. We'll go back to these females in a bit. Planes and trains, you'd like to know is the first question of the day. What is the head of a herd of elephant called? head of a herd of elephant called? It's called the matriarch planes and trains. So the matriarch elephant is the oldest, fittest, wisest elephant cow in a group of elephants. And that's what it's called, the matriarch. Quite a nice name, hey? Hyenas are also, also have matriarchs. And arguably I would say that lions also have matriarchs actually. Now, why don't we shoot you over to my colleagues 
far in the north where it is going to be green and lush for them to say hello and Scott is going to be the first one to greet you. Good afternoon and it is a great pleasure to be the first to welcome you into the Masai Mara. It is a beautiful hot and sunny afternoon as you can see the wildebeest are littering the plains. My name is Scott. I'm teamed up with Craig on camera and we've got a whole bunch of friends that are joining us today. Look at all these flies and I'm attempting to make friends with them but it's tricky not to get the shivers. I think when they when they do a moonwalk, then you, ooh, you get that <laughs> kind of a shiver. <laughs> We're in the hope of finding some cheetah. We got reports of both the Musketeer Coalition as well as Malaika and her two boys being in this general area. <clears throat> so, with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to find one of the two groups. And if we are very lucky, we'll be able to see those two different sets of cheetah converge. It would be a very, very interesting affair to witness. So that is our plan for this afternoon. Good prospects. They were seen probably about a mile apart from one another, but we are not sure exactly where they were left. And we are also not sure exactly what they've got up to since they were last seen by any tourist vehicles. So. We haven't seen many vehicles out now, I'm guessing, because it's so hot. But hopefully some people will head out for the evening drive. Some guys who had better intelligence as to their position in the morning. And once we see a few vehicles clustered together, we know that there's a possible sighting that we can go and cash in on. Or we may just bump into something random along the way. It's... World Animal Day at some point this week and our plan is to pick an animal every day. I'm not sure if Steph's already let you know and today is the leopard and that would be a very very welcome surprise. I've only seen leopard on two occasions in the three months of being here which is obviously very different to the amount of leopard sightings you get graced with down in Juma where Steph's busy cruising about. So we're kind of relying on him to find the leopard today. But in this little valley off to our right, there's lots of cover and a possible home for a leopard. Or who knows what other interesting beasts may grace us with their presence. Happy to see so many wildebeest still in this area. Even if I stop here, so we've driven a little bit from the last view you had. And let's just take another view out. The views here are quite spectacular. Look at those clouds as well. Beautiful. Hello to Sinak. You would like to know what has happened to the migration? Well, it has migrated or at least begun migrating south into Tanzania. And they only spend about three or four months of the year in Kenya. The rest of the year they are south of the Kenyan border in Tanzania, in the Serengeti. So... They're on their way out, but these guys are the lazy bones, bringing up the rear end of the herds. Some of them will remain, and it's impossible to say whether the wildebeest we're looking at now may decide to stay or go. But not all of them will leave, nor will all the zebra, nor will all the Thompson's gazelle, which apparently also migrates. We didn't see a huge influx this year. There's some Tommies in the background. So... It's quite interesting. It would be nice to get to the bottom of it. Apparently when James was here last year um, doing a few tests and getting some kind of stock footage, they did see Thompson's gazelle crossing the Mara River in September. So they were definitely later than the wildebeest and the zebra. But now we're into October and we still haven't noticed any major difference. Spectacular views though. I hope you're enjoying and you wouldn't believe it, but Steph has been doing an incredible, incredible job trying to track down a leopard for you. And I think he may just be a few moments away from that. So don't go anywhere. If you had any plans, cancel them if you'd like to see a leopard. Because there is a strong chance that he has got one in his sights for you guys. And aren't we so lucky to be able to send you from the Masai Mara viewing migrating herds of wildebeest all the way down south to South Africa on Juma to Mr. Vinterboer with a leopard.
Goodbye. In the whole of Juma and it, uh, it, we, we came and had a look at it yesterday, it's a Scotia. But of course, today is also another day and today is World Animal Day and we've decided to celebrate World Animal Day with leopard. And look what we've got lying underneath this tree right now. There you go. That is young Hosanna. For those of you who don't know who Hosanna is, it's a young male leopard, uh, probably now about, ooh, don't quite know how old it is, probably about 16 to 18 months old. And fully independent of his mom, so he's a young adult, and he's just enjoying the late afternoon breeze on top of this termite mound and the shade of this giant old man that is the Scotia above him. And not a care in the world. And of course it had to be him that had to celebrate World Animal Day with us. Just have a look at that camouflage on top of this termite mound. You know there's not a stitch of vegetation on top there. And if you weren't carefully looking, you'd almost miss him for sure. And we are parked about 30 yards away from him at the moment. And he doesn't have a worry. Fast asleep again. There was some elephant that were walking past him and he lifted up his head to see what the elephant were doing and that is how I spotted him, that very distinctive sort of clubbed profile of a leopard or a lion or that a leopard and a lion has. Oh, he's looking good. This is the first time I'm seeing Hosanna. Um, let me just think if it's the first time I've ever seen Hosanna actually. I want to say that this is the first time I'm seeing this particular leopard. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I may have seen Kurula's cubs once, perhaps twice before, but I doubt it. I haven't taken a vehicle game drive in Juma for a very, very long time. And of course, seeing leopard on foot is difficult. I think the last time I saw, I actually haven't seen him. I saw, no, I did see him on foot once. It must be the second or third time I'm seeing him. I'm just trying to think back, which is incredible, actually. I'm very happy that he came out to celebrate with us today. Remember, this is an interactive show. Please ask us some questions. If you want to know a little bit more about Leopard, or you've, had, you've heard something, or you want to share a story from an encounter you had when you were visiting Africa, perhaps, or dreaming of Leopards, please go right ahead. Use Twitter and YouTube. We'll monitor those questions and, uh, and we'll answer those we can. Ah, I see his paws are getting big as well. He's turning into a good looking cat, wow. Now, <clears throat> currently he's not sexually mature. That'll only happen from about two and a half years old. And he'll only really be able to fight for females from about five to seven years old. But at about two and a half years old, he's going to start to antagonize the two dominant male leopard that hold sway over this area. Leopard territories are fluid like an amoeba and it's their, their boundaries sort of ebb and flow with the seasons and with each leopard's condition. And uh, the two male leopard that hold sway over this area, a leopard called um, Tingana and another leopard called Mvula, both of which are not the youngest leopard anymore. I think they got. I think they still got some pluck in them. One of which is is uh, is his father, this particular leopard's father. And uh, there's a very good chance at this uh, at this point that uh, that he just inherits the area. Uh, this area from one of his, from one of these big male leopards. It's a very fine line between when a leopard becomes too old to effectively patrol their territory, in particular from their son. And while under normal circumstances, uh, this young leopard will be forced out and into a life, a nomadic lifestyle for about two and a half to three years, which gets them far away from their natal range. From time to time, as is the case now, a young male cub will be maturing and getting into their prime as their father is exiting theirs. And it's going to be quite interesting to see over the next couple of years exactly what that means. Next couple of months, in fact, 
exactly what that means for young Hosanna. Is he going to stick around? Is he not going to stick around? A year from now, are we still going to be seeing him? Will he start to actively defend a small territory of his own inside his father's and Mvula's territory? There's all these unknowns. Right now, the sunlight falling on his coat there, isn't that fantastic? Nice surprise. I'm glad you're all enjoying it. Louise, who's directing the show on this side today, says that everybody's commenting on the fact that it's so lovely to see him again. It is very nice. A gray cloud behind him with the sunlight on his shoulders. Is the herald of summer to come. Now, <clears throat> Leopard will sleep uh, during the day. They don't always sleep during the day. Uh, and that's because unlike lion, which are sort of, we cooperatively hunt with each other. Leopard don't, and very similar to every other house cat or cat that you've ever taken any sort of uh, notice of, they have moments when they'll sleep and do nothing, and they also have moments when they don't. And it all is related to him and a territory, or, um, or basically what type of, uh, how hungry he is, in other words, and doesn't look like he's too hungry, this guy. I actually just want to see if there's not a kill lying in this tree somewhere. Usually, if you scan decently all the branches that sort of look like they can harbor a decent sized kill, we might be lucky to see something. You can see that his belly has got a slight bulge to it, and it's not because something's pushing it from underneath. He's actually got some food in there. Now, leopard at this age although very skilled at hunting and uh, he would be living on a very wide range of things now from lizards to eggs to fish even birds impala steenbuck diker um, not quite taking massive things just yet that's in the realm of the older leopard you know things like buffalo calves and kudu and things like that but it's going to be interesting to see as well over the years to come what type of hunter he will become what what will he prefer to eat quite nice all right james henry is waiting to say hello to you all so i'm going to stay here with uh, young hosana and announce his presence on the radio and james will say hello ah we're going to cancel that because james's picture is gone which is also not too much of a worry these things happen when live so as James is moving, of course, he's moving between trees and rocks and bushes and whatnot, and sometimes the signal gets cut off, and uh, we manage to stop that. So we'll go to James's in a little bit and leaves us some more time with this leopard. Now, going over to the activity periods, as he gets older, he'll get a character, and that character will be defined by uh, his experiences, uh, but it'll also be defined uh, by by his, by his mother to a degree um, and although it's not as clearly defined as in lion my point is, is that lions in a pride will learn how to hunt uh, something in their area and they'll become very good at it where it, whether it's zebra or wildebeest or buffalo or even elephant in some cases leopard will learn some things from their mom but the thing that they will specialize in eventually is exp is 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 experientially learnt. Um, some old male leopard will enjoy hunting aardvark, warthog, some male leopard will learn how to hunt buffalo, some male leopard like male leopard called Quarantine from a few years ago, a distant brother to this one, learnt how to hunt kudu and would hunt full-grown female kudu, many many times bigger than what he is. bush lovers you've asked me an interesting question is it is it possible to identify a leopard kill on the ground if it's not in the tree and obviously if the leopard's not present um, 
That's a good question because in areas outside of the game reserves where leopards are a little bit less common um, and also smaller, they hunt a, v a, a much more varied diet and it's made up of smaller things. So quite often you'll find something under a bush and it's quite difficult to tell which of the cats killed it. Now obviously tracks are one thing. Uh, you can distinguish a kill by using tracks of the animal. So that would be my first thing. Secondly is where the animal uh, bit, uh, you know, where was the death bite across the, the throat uh, is quite common for leopard to do uh, and caracal on the back of the head, caracal and serval. Um, yeah, that is a good question. I would say that the only definitive answer would be really would be the tracks. You'd need to find yourself a track and then decide whether it was a small leopard or a large caracal, uh, in my opinion. And obviously leopard tracks are much bigger than what those other smaller cats are. Good question there. Now how long will he lay on this termite mound for? He'll probably be here for the next couple of hours. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. It doesn't look like he's going to. Chandler, you'd like to know if leopards can recognize one another from their spot patterns. That's another good question. I would imagine so. Um, in particular, mothers will, will be able to recognize children. Um, fathers would be able to recognize young leopard that grew up in their areas, whether they fathered them or not. Um, and you can see that they, they approach one another quite cautiously, but they will look at one another. And I think they do recognize facial features, very similar to how we would. I don't think it's at the same level of detail. We've got a massive portion of our very big brains dedicated to studying the faces of other human beings. And I don't think it would be the same with leopard, but I definitely think they can recognize each other over distance. And I definitely also think that they'll be able to do it using spot patterns, although not to the same detail that we would use them. You know, the spot patterns above their whiskers, which we use. But it would be more like an overall shape and size recognition. And when you see these animals for a long time, like a, a, lot of, a lot of our long time viewers are even better than what we are at identifying leopard from a far distance away just by looking at their profile. And it's very similar, I would imagine, with, uh, with these animals. Right, now we're going to be sending over to Brent, not James, uh, this time, who'd like to say hello to you all. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to the absolutely magnificent Masai Mara. Manu and I are together this afternoon. My name is Brent Smith, and we're going to take you on an absolutely fantastic adventure. Ha! Ah, what are our plans? Now, let me tell you our plans. Our plans are to head a little bit towards the south and up towards the escarpment. I'm going to go see if that female cheetah that James was with yesterday might be a bit peckish. After that, as the sun starts to set, I'm going to head down towards that hippopotamus uh, that Jamie had this morning with the lion and hyena. And who knows, there might be a bit of maniacal cackling and fighting over that carcass as it gets later on. It is, of course, right in the core of the clan lands, North Clan's territory territory 80 plus hyenas versus one young male lion hopefully he gets some no idea what could happen next so remember hashtag safari live uh, if you ask any questions I'm not the only one out here. Let's go and to the man on the other side of the river towards the south, nestled amongst one of my favorite parts of the whole Mara, the Sand River, James Henry. Let's see what eloquent words he can use to describe that area. Hello, hello and good morning. No, good afternoon. We find ourselves well far to the east of the Masai Mara. We're here probably about, oh, I'd say three quarters all the way to the east. And uh, my name is James Henry. Fergus is on camera.
There we go. And John is the Ascari with us today. Uh, please do talk to us during the course of today, hashtag Safari Live, or on the YouTube chat stream. It'll be wonderful to hear from you, have your questions and your comments. Now, I think this is one As soon as you get far east where we are now, it becomes much more rolling countryside, and it's very lovely. We do have a few signal and communications difficulties here, but our aim this afternoon is to go and find some small cubs of the Black Rock Pride and see if we don't get very lucky there. Uh, if we don't, well, then we'll try and possibly sniff about the remnants of the migration. I did see one or two fairly large herds a little bit earlier, and we think, Fergus and I, that that in fact is the Black Rock, on account of the fact that it is a rock, and it is... That's right, Black, well done. Good, so that's our plan today. And then before we go too uh, far into the cat hunt, uh, Judy H, I have a special thing for you. Unfortunately, I uh, can't see one around us. There are these lovely pale peachy colored flowers. Let's go back a bit. There are lots around here. Stand by one. No idea what they are. But they're the most beautiful colour. Here they go. Fergus will find you one that looks nice on camera, won't you, Fergus? They seem to be annuals that have just popped out of the ground now. Look at that. It's almost like a daisy. Not the neatest flowers in the world, but you can appreciate why the colour is just so magnificent. It's like a sort of pale, cloudy dawn, really. So that's very lovely indeed. Alrighty, shall we go and see if we can find the Black Rock Pride? Wherever they may be. Hopefully not far from that Black Rock over there. I've just seen, seen somebody coming from here. So maybe we'll be lucky. Chantal, you just keep checking on the comms because we may lose you as we go down this hill. Chantel is directing. Yeah, I'm de definitely losing her at the moment. I'm just going to change something here. No, no, not that. Try again, Chantel, if you wouldn't mind. Oh dear. No, no, we should be okay. Yeah, we got you pretty much two or three out of five to do for now. Should have good signal there, so when we find tiny baby lion cubbies, uh, we should be able to show them to you, which is excellent. All right, while we continue having a look around here, we are going to hand you back to Stefan Hosanna. Obviously, you still have a few seconds to get there because, uh, well, you know, Steph's a bit slower than us, which means that he's operating 20 minutes in the past, 20 seconds in the past, and so I will see you when we come back just now. Back to this now. What I'd like to show you is, well, I'd like to prompt you to take a, uh, a screenshot of this, this particular Scotia growing, on, or this particular weeping boar bean, it's also called a Scotia, growing on top of this termite mound, is, I've also walked up to here thinking, oh, it would be fantastic to see a leopard here or in this tree, and this is nice to see. Of course, Ali has also mentioned from time to time that she would love to see a leopard on this termite mound or in this tree, and uh, going to take a screenshot and send it to her. Not quite the same, but almost. Well, we have changed position slightly just so that we could get you a better view of, uh, of his face, basically, without a branch in the way. And Senzo will zoom in now if you can see a picture of this sleepy kitty cat. Isn't that just lovely? Flat profile, raised up above the bush, breeze blowing on him.
Jared's buddy, you'd like to know if uh, Hosanna would recognize his sister, Shongile. Uh, yes, absolutely. He'll recognize her from a distance away. They'll become less tolerant of one another. First, she of him. As she ap approaches two and a half years of age, she begins to become sexually mature and she will not tolerate the presence of a young immature male around her even if it's her brother uh, and at that point she's going to start to elicit the attentions of the two older males in this area the Tingana and Mvula and at this I think that they still have a couple more cubs to father or to sire themselves they still very much a very active male leopards in this particular area with a third being Kijima in this area as well um, who's much older and bigger than young Hosanna but tends to be in a slightly different uh, area and so she'll get less tolerant of him is basically my point but she will absolutely recognize him I think and for a very long time as well I don't think that uh, I don't think that they lose that ability Ew, that is a beautiful animal Now, what's Steph, you've asked me um, if Tingana would share meals and territories with his offspring. Um, because, they, you know, because they're related and because I suppose they share this bond, male leopard, apart from siring cubs, have no further or nothing further to do with the gestation period, of course, but also of the rearing of those cubs. Um, However, having said that, I'm of the opinion that leopard know where, where each other are uh, to a point. I wouldn't say, you know, GPS accurate, but to a point. And I think that male leopard, although you very rarely see adult male leopard with their offspring, it, it's not uncommon. We've seen young leopard sharing kills with older leopard before and interactions between them as well. But... I think that they keep tabs on on what leopard are in and around and of course the bush will be infused with their smell and their scent and so I think they're a lot more aware of their offspring than what we give them credit for um, but as for sharing uh, kills and and you know experiences with each other once again it's not uncommon for for female leopard to stash kills and bring cubs to to kills to help them out and and augment their diets is it have i seen it as male leopard before no is it feasible you know why not uh, I, I, it'll be a stronger bond between female and cub than it will be between male and cub does he recognize his offspring absolutely in my opinion does he keep tabs on where his offspring is and how are they doing in my opinion absolutely Therefore, is it unfeasible to think that he might at a point stash a kill and leave it to this young male? He wouldn't go fetch this young male onto a kill like a female would. But would he abandon a kill? I don't think abandon, but I definitely think that he would, he would allow co-feeding on it. Yeah, interesting question. And I definitely think feasible. Granny, could Hosanna and Tamba form a coalition uh, with one another since they're so young? Um, I, just for the rest of our viewers who perhaps don't know who Tamba is, Tamba is a young male leopard to another female leopard in this area in an adjacent but neighboring uh, leopard territory. And the question is, would these cats form an alliance when there's no blood relation? There is, there is of course, they share the same, uh, they share the same mother. Uh, Tumba's mother is this young leopard's mother, or Tumba's grandmother is this leopard's mother, basically. And so there is a blood tie there. Um, Wow, would they form a coalition with one another? I'm going to say no to that. 
Um, the reason being is that male leopard don't form coalitions. They, they, they're just genetically programmed the same as every other solitary cat around, with the exception of lion, to be solitary. And I think that they would choose a solitary lifestyle over a coalition every time. The only cats to display coalition activity or coalition behavior are lions, and they are unique. And the only reason why they have formed coalitions with one another is to bring down and be able to hunt large boned herbivores um, in, an e in an effort to stratify themselves out of the competition between other cat species or solitary cat species. Um, and I don't think that, I think that that is a, 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 a genetic adaptation or an evolution rather than um, rather than something that is normally occurring in these in these cats so I'd say no to that to that uh, to that question um, but a good question nonetheless I mean from our point of view why not I mean, they could help one another they could they could uh, they could bring down food together they could keep one another safe Last question. All right, we're going to need to update the radio now, as I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of people wanting to come and see what is happening over here. So we're going to send you over to Scott, who's just driving around, and we're going to jump onto our sighting admin. Well, that would certainly be interesting if male leopards did form coalitions. Sadly, it is not the case. It would be very nice if they did. Quite a bit of a crime scene that we've spotted here. A whole bunch of vultures and marabou storks. A seriously big bunch of vultures, actually. So we're going to go and take a quick look, see what all the fuss is about. And who knows, maybe it was the cheetah that we're looking for that made this kill a little bit earlier. It's going to be tricky to tell. But at least we are in the area of some kind of predator, one would assume. Having said that though, the animal may have died of natural causes. That does happen from time to time. Look at all these vultures. Crazy. All sorts dotted in there, lappet faced white-backed, I'm sure there's some Cape Griffin vultures as well, the marabou storks, and all of the birds you can see, well, a lot of them are holding their beaks open, panting like a very warm afternoon, that coupled together with the fact that they are full-bellied from whatever they've been nibbling on there, means that they are all trying to keep cool, thankfully a cloud has just come over though. So that should help them. Let's see if we can take a close look at what they're nibbling on there, Craig. The ones on the right seem to be squabbling. Ah, oh, it's a wildebeest. No surprises there. Oh, look at one's feeding straight into its mouth. Isn't that interesting? Oh, that was so cool. These ones coming, taking off towards us. Oh, now, if we'll get lucky, we'll see them start squabbling with one another. Ah, oh, awesome. <laughs> Well, we are in pole position here. Seems like the runway is towards us. They must be flying, taking off into the wind. That will assist their takeoff. Not that there's much of a breeze. And I would guess a lot of them would have eaten their full and are now heading off to somewhere to roost for the evening. What I found interesting is that the Mara vultures, when they are full bellied, they lie down on the floor like chickens incubating an egg. And I've never seen that before, but I guess because it's so open here, they can afford to. One's kind of doing it there. Oh, look at that lappet face, showing itself, showing the other ones how big and strong it is. Oh, that was cool. And, oh, there's also a hooded vulture. So there's all three different types. You're just to the right of the lappet face there, Craig, if you just zoom in. There's one with a much smaller head, just to the right of the one with the big head on the left of your screen. So that's the smallest of the vultures next to the biggest. There's another hooded vulture with a pink head that's popped in. Looks like a miniature lappet-faced. And they all have their different role. 
on finishing up the carcasses, the ones with the big beaks obviously do the bulk of the feeding. Opening up the things that are tricky. Let's go hard left here, Craig, quickly. Just want to see what's going on there. There's a piglet running for its life. Look at that! <laughs> now, I'm not sure why the piglet and its mother are heading off so quickly. So I'm just going to take a bit of a scan around. I mean, there's lots of Thompson's gazelle that seemed very relaxed in the area, so maybe it's just a nervous mother. I was expecting to see a cheetah tearing after them at one point. There was actually a Thompson's gazelle kind of running behind that piglet, and I thought it may have been a cheetah. Good. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little vulture restaurant extravaganza as much as I'm enjoying the flies this afternoon. You also now have the joy of going to James, who's found some other tiny creatures. Look at this, everybody. I have never, ever seen anything like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight little cubs. Now, I just need to find out, are we live on Facebook? I just don't want to do the introduction too many times. Look at this. Hello, everybody who's just joined us on whatever platform you happen to be on. We've just come across the Black Rock Pride here. They're sitting with seven, it looks like, little cubs. They've just come out of the rocks over here. There are two lionesses, only one of them doing the feeding at the moment. My name's James Henry, and we're going to sit with these cubs for a little while and see what happens. The other lioness is now coming up to help, I think, with a bit of the mothering. And I have never seen a collection of cubs this young and this numerous, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. We're just going to let them get a little bit more comfortable with us, and then I'm going to move forward. She's just got up and called them out from the rocks where they were hiding. Now the other lioness is also calling a little bit. Here she comes. She's going to come past us now. I'm just going to talk quietly. Both lionesses obviously lactating. Both lionesses obviously hungry. Look at this little reunion that's going to take place between mother and child here. Look at this. Liz, you say amazing. Yes, it is just astonishing. I've been in the bush now for nigh on 10 and, well, nigh on 15 years. I've never seen nine little cubs like this. Is that not too gorgeous for words? Please send us your questions or comments like Liz was doing. You can do it in the comments section of whatever platform you're using. Folks, shall I just try and move around a bit there? Robin, I'm afraid I missed your question. I'm just gonna nip around here. This is just absolutely astounding. Oh, no, I have to agree with you, Robin. You say nothing more precious than lion cubs. There, I, I've never seen a scene like this. I'm really quite gobsmacked by it. Is that right, folks? We're just going to talk quite quietly. Obviously, the sound of the vehicle is much louder than the sound of my voice, but, of course, they have seen vehicles before. Now, I don't think that all of these nine cubs came from these two lionesses. There is another lioness of the Black Rock Pride, so named, of course, for the black rocks that you can see all around us. How old they are? I couldn't begin. Well, I'm telling. I could tell you that I think they are between. I would say whew, five weeks, maybe six, up to about two months. They've all given birth at much the same time. And what that speaks to is some kind of a pride takeover where males came into the area, killed the cubs that were here, and then mated with these females at the same time. And that's created the situation with this enormous nursery of nine magnificent little lions. All right, I don't even know where to look here. 
you're looking at ones playing with sticks, I'm looking at some others having a play around some other sticks. There are some suckling, there are others just kind of lying about the place, but we've just arrived at exactly the most perfect time because I think they're going to start their evening playtime, which is just the best. This is just too magnificent. Now, in case you're wondering, we are in the Maasai Mara in, of course, Kenya, southwest Kenya. And the important thing to note here is that I'm not sure these lionesses have given birth quite at the right time. Uh, obviously, they can't control that. But the mass of the wildebeest migration has moved to the south. There is one biggish herd quite a long way to the north of us and so these lionesses while not uh, certainly they're not bereft of uh, opportunities for prey what they're going to do is just struggle a little bit more than they would have when the migration herds were here but these cubs all look very healthy and very happy. Why wouldn't they? They live in one of the world's most beautiful places. Riti, you say they're eating the grass. No, I think they're just chewing it, Riti. I don't think they're eating it at all. I think they're just playing. I don't think they're, they're eating the grass. This is just beyond magic. You almost can't conceive of it. Alright, if you want to keep watching this everyone, just come to wildsafarilive.com. We're going to sit here for the whole afternoon. If something more astounding happens here, then absolutely we'll come back live on Facebook. So stay with us. Um, are we still on air with the normal safari group, our loyal friends and followers? There you are. Hello, everybody. Still with us. Is this not very special indeed? Are you not so amazed by the things you are seeing here? A carpet of nine cubs stomping all over their mothers? And, well, obviously one of them, I think, is an aunt, unless, yeah, I mean, look, it's highly unlikely that one gave birth to five and one gave birth to four. And now nature's greatest sound starts, that of squabbling lion cubs. It's certainly one of my favourites. You know, I haven't had an experience like this. Well, I've never had an experience of nine little lion cubs like this. But my last cub experience that vaguely approached this was when the Inkuhumas, oh, it must have been 18 months ago, produced those three what I referred to as teddies. <laughs> we are so lucky here. Brent mentioned them, he said, look, go and have a look. I'm not, you know, he, he was pretty confident that we'd find them, but I, I didn't know. I've never been into this area, and here they are. Just so special. Now, to see nine little lion cubs like this is the same more than four weeks apart from each other is even more unusual and to have them almost completely to ourselves is utterly spectacularly privileged alrighty we're going to hand you back over to Juma now apparently Hosanna is stalking one of his most favorite meals in the world I'm assuming we still have about 12 seconds to go until we get there 
and so I hope that uh, Hosanna, while we wait with these cubs, uh, catches his monitor lizard. We've got something unusual happening here. We've got a young male leopard and it seems like he has managed to separate two mating monitor lizards or legavans. They're the largest lizard species that we we get here and What's happened, I think, is that this leopard has been a bit confounded with which one to choose. The larger one, in my opinion, he's left alone and he's going for a smaller one. And monitor lizards... <laughs> Hello and welcome to this it's a young leopard live from Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sands. We have got a leopard hunting some monitor lizards with us just off here. My name is Stefan Winterboer and this is a leopard that we've been following from pretty much since they were born. And we can't wait to see what he wants to do. Just finished hunting now. Isn't that just amazing? monitor lizards all over the place there we go there's the monitor lizard large lizard several feet long this particular one is probably in the region of about six or seven foot long this leopard looks like it's lost some interest now though which is unusual usually they wouldn't hesitate to kill monitor lizards like this forms they form very large portion of uh, very large portion of their diet Looks like he's busy stalking something else. Could there be a third monitor lizard here? Quite possible actually, and the reason for that is that a female monitor lizard that is being attended by a couple of males will elicit the attentions of a few males and that will be enticing for this young leopard. The fact that this leopard has been unable to make the kill I think is just literally because there's too much going on here with regards to these young these it's gonna make a pounce come on it looks like this leopard's gonna pounce there we go come on jump you can see that that setting up is very similar to other cats that you've seen there's something in that bush Don't worry about the noise of crashing around us. It's not elephants, just another vehicle. Um, right now we are, it's, it's, we're coming to you live from the Kruger National Park, which is in South Africa, the western side of South Africa. We're about in the center of the Kruger National Park on its, on its western border. And we've got a young male leopard here, is probably between 16 or 18 months old, and independent already hunting what I think is a trio of monitor lizards. I think the reason why this leopard is hunting these monitor lizards is because there's a female, a female monitor lizard in, and who is needing her eggs fertilized and there's a couple of males that are responding to the pheromones that she's letting out. Just have a look at how camouflaged these animals are, isn't it just amazing? There's the monitor lizard, there's one there. largest lizard that we find out here. I don't know what... Now, in the comment section of what you're watching right now, there is the ability to ask us questions. We are live and interactive at the moment, so feel free to ask me a question and we'll answer as many as what we can. Or even just leave a comment about what you're seeing. This is the first live leopard hunt that you've ever watched in your life. Now that very intent gaze. Let's see if I can get us into a slightly... Zara, you're saying that lizard looks so scary. I must agree with you there, Zara. Excuse my bald head, that's also a bit scary. But let's go forward a little bit, give us a bit of a better view of the leopard, but also of this monitor lizard. I don't quite know what to prompt us to look at at the moment. It's a lot of action going on. We've got, that's a white-throated monitor. 
they're still very upset to the fact that it's being hunted. You can see that the throat is all puffed up, but trying to make some distance. You can see they're blowing his throat up. I think he's had his ego a bit dented by this leopard. He's lucky not to have become dinner. It's about a six foot lizard that, maybe a bit shorter than that. Let's go back to that leopard quickly and see what's going on. There's just such an... In Betty, you'd like to know if the leopard would eat the eggs or the lizard. That's a good question, Betty. I, you know, knowing leopard have, have quite a ver varied diet. I think that the leopard would eat everything. Uh, Ava could have killed this, uh, could have killed this lizard, it would have, and it would have eaten its eggs. Now the eggs are still, there we go, there we go. Ooh. That was a rabbit, a young rabbit. Oh, that leopard, did you see that? I'm hoping that we got all that. Awesome. I don't think that that leopard caught that young, it's a, there's a scrub here. I don't think that that leopard caught it because we would have heard um, a giant squealing if it did. But wasn't that amazing? See the live leopard, or well, live leopard hunt, I suppose. Uh, there we have. Now that leopard has run away into some thick, monstrously thick bush. Uh, let's hope we can get one more view of this young leopard. I don't think so. It's going to be a very difficult thing to get inside there. Let's see if we can change our view a little bit. Let's see if we can't pick out what that young leopard was looking at. I can't see where this leopard has disappeared into this bush. And it's probably just massaging a broken ego at the moment, to be quite honest with you. I think it is gone. All right. Well, that was that, I think, for this particular leopard hunt. We will catch you again on another one of these live um, broadcasts. See you all soon. everybody I'm still getting used to these live broadcast things from uh, from the middle of a show <laughs> so, uh, I hope you'd excuse me with a couple of the mistakes I made there now what we want to try and do and see if we can see where this where this leopard disappeared to I think it is going to be difficult but what I will do is stick around a little bit more just to see if he comes out from behind you. So we're gonna stick around a little bit more and uh, we're gonna send you over to James who's found some lion cubs to show you. Oh, we're still here and they are just behaving in a more and more magnificently adorable fashion the longer we sit here. They've come up onto this rock to have a little bit of a drink of water. There's a puddle in here perfectly framed with green vegetation and the lions are now playing with each other, with each other's tails, with their mother's tails. They're having a little bit of a suckle here and there. One or two have had a small swim and the mothers, ever patient, are sitting on the rock wondering how it is that their youth has come to this rather, shall we say, stressful time of looking after nine gorgeous little cubs. <laughs> uh, it, it really is difficult to know where to look. I cannot believe how lucky we've been. Thank you to Brent, of course, for suggesting we come down here. Just wonderful stuff. So their story will be difficult and interesting to un... or oh, not difficult, but it'll be interesting to watch unfold. Because we made quite a meal of the fact, I think, 
that when the migration is not here, these lions struggle, that there is some dearth of things for them to eat when the migration has disappeared. I personally am not sure that that's true. I think that there's a lot left here. But if ever there was going to be a way to find out if the lions struggled without their... <laughs> Look at that mother there. That's a young male, you can see. If ever there was a way to find out how much these lions do struggle in the absence of the big migration herds, well, this is going to be that opportunity. Because to raise all nine of this lot is going to be no mean feat at all. What have we got there, Ferg? Oh, a carcass, yes. As Fergus is pointing out, they seem to be killing fairly successfully. And what is that, do you think? A boof? So that's a buffalo. And it's not a, it's certainly not a, a migrating animal, so they're obviously killing and around here. Now, silly cow, I'm not being facetious or nasty, everybody, that is the name that somebody has given themselves on Twitter. You want to know if the cubs will have a closer bond, having been born around the same time? Absolutely they will. And they will share a huge, they will share all their life experiences together and that will absolutely make them closer. And certainly the males in this group, you know, of the nine cubs, there are probably potentially four males, four or five males, maybe even more. They'll almost certainly leave the pride when they do leave as a coalition, if they all survive, of course, to the point that they do leave, which will be at about three years or so and the females will remain in the same pride, and I'm sure that they will have a closer bond as a result of the fact that they were born at such a similar time. No, I mean, this is just too frighteningly wonderful. His mum giving a little bit of discipline there, along with licks, a number of bites. I mean, those teeth are, are terrifying. We were watching the two lionesses before you came to see these little cubs, and they were just being so affectionate with each other and it's so impossible to imagine when you see them behaving in such a sort of house catish manner that they could be these terrifying killers but that changes in a second when you hear them growl or you see them open their mouths that one there and I don't think you should look at anything else. The other lioness is lying on the rocks, got three or four cubs jumping on her. I mean it really is, it's very special. This tail being played with, there's definitely going to be trouble here. Yeah Rita, you say the lioness looks exhausted. I, I often think they do, but you know, I often think that that's our human perspective being put onto them. I'm sure they do get tired having all these cubs around, but remember, they're unable to show any facial expression other than anger when they lift their or snarl or when they put their ears back. So when they're just sitting but normally with their mouths closed and their ears forward, we don't know if they're tired or uh, hungry or sad or what they are. But I think that the thought of, we know how difficult one human child is to uh, sort of raise. The thought of nine is just almost impossible to contemplate, and I think that makes it almost tiring to watch nine youngsters being raised by just two mums. Certainly, I, I have two nephews, and they <laughs> they have given their parents more than. Uh, you know, more than their, odd, their fair share of sleepless nights. I can just imagine my brother and sister-in-law trying to raise nine Jack and Williams and it would be an absolute nightmare. Look at the sun coming out on them now. They're talking all the time. Oh. We are seriously lucky people. And the little squeaks and squeals.
Now, I believe that Hosanna is uh, behaving in a manner very patient, of course, but I would have thought that given the heat of the day and the, uh, well, I'm sure he's quite hungry and the prey that he's going for, that he would have done it by now. Well, let's go and find if he does manage to do it now. Welcome back everybody. This young male leopard has come from inside the bush and come back out again and is lying very close to his monitor lizard and I think the female. And uh, you can just see this you can just see this leopard is lying in attendance with this thing. I think it went off to the easier went off to the easier prey and uh, and is now just lying up well, after the easier prey in terms of the rabbit that it chased and missed, but now... Hello and welcome everybody to this live broadcast from Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Kruger National Park. This young male leopard has been hunting uh, just next to our cars between 16 and 18 months old, just missed a rabbit and now has started to hunt a monitor lizard. That is a monitor lizard and although it doesn't look like much, it's one of the largest lizards that we find in this area. My name is Stefan Winterboer and we've been following this young male leopard since he was born basically and it's just such a pleasure to sit so close to this leopard in the open like we are and bring it to you live uh, all the way from the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Don't forget you can or you can ask us questions and please do using the question bar and oh big yawn on this cat oxygenating his blood not wanting to let this lizard out of his sight it's a young leopard and they'll pretty much take whatever they can at the moment doesn't look like he's interested in killing it but these lizards definitely don't go down without a fight as you can see puffed up throat and puffed up body tail curled for a whip like motion and they're lying down. Isn't that amazing? Now, these leopards are so relaxed with us because we don't, oh, look at this, let's see. These leopards are so relaxed with us because pretty much since they were born, we've had a very uniform, uh, we've had a very, very, uh, standardized approach with how we uh, we deal with these cats and we're always very respectful about their space. Now Pippa Moorman all the way from Hootsprate in South Africa has just said hello, hello Pippa, good to see you or good to hear from you. Now, what this young male leopard is doing is stretching out the tendons in the claws. It's as much a display of its insecurity as anything else. I think that this lizard is giving this leopard pause for concern. These lizards bite incredibly hard. They've also got raking claws that can do some damage. However, I don't think it would do much damage to this particular, this particular cat at all. And now just leaving it in actual fact and walking away. I'll tell you. They have larger brains than what lion do in a cat that's about a quarter of the size and that leads them to have characters and they develop characters as they get a little bit older, personalities, they learn from experiences and um, why this leopard just missed and left this monitor lizard, who knows, search of easier prey perhaps. What are you looking at now? Something else is Fad, you just asked what leopard this is. This is a Hosanna. Uh, Hosanna is a about an 18 month year old leopard or 18 month leopard. Um, it was born right here, Juma Private Game Reserve. And we've been following the life of this cat whenever we can see them. Newly independent, uh, been on his own now for a couple of months. And he's quite capable of killing animals right up to the size of Impala, all on his own. 
the moment something has his attention. Now, being, let's call it sub-adult, although he is independent, means that they have quite short attention spans and things like movement in these thickets will definitely grab this leopard's attention. And you can just see how wonderful that camouflage is. The moment the only thing that you can really see is the flicker of the tail. And that is standing in open bush. There's only two, two scraggly little branches between us and, uh, and that leopard. And already the edges of that cat blend in so well with the bush uh, behind it. This is our dry season in the Kruger National Park. Oh, there's something walking there. That is a great day cat. It's an antelope right in the prey size. We're going to see a live hunt, everybody. This is a hunt. What are you doing, youngster? You're, of course, going to go out of our view right now. Here we go. Up on the side of a termite mound. Going to use the cover on top of the bush. What are you going to do? Stalking. They ambush specialists, getting within 5 to 10 meters of prey before pouncing. Let's see what's going to happen right now. We can't move from where we are. This bush is too thick for us to get through. We're going to have to just take it as it comes now. And hopefully, Lady Luck smiles on us and we can see most of this hunt. It's this leopard using the cover that it has and has just disappeared over the side of that term up by now. I'm going to use my ears now. And hopefully we can hear the kill taking place and we can get into that tight bush to see. Here we go, out the back, I can just see his head sticking out the side. Look how low they can go. Dead quiet, but that flicker of the tail, that, that is quite often what spoils a hunt. A young leopard, tail flicking and agitation and just that lack of confidence. They'll learn how to become deathly quiet. Now watch that tail, there he goes. Are we going to see the sprint? Oh, hidden behind the bush, no! <laughs> I can just see the coat moving there. Now we're going to listen now. Let's see if we can hear the kill take place. We're not going to go crashing through there, we might disturb that particular hunt and what we don't want to do is steal food from a young male leopard. They need every protein calorie that they can get. Isn't this exciting? Waiting now in anticipation, waiting. See if we can hear the rush of the body, the takedown and unfortunately the death cry of their prey. So are we. Leopard will very often stalk to a very short distance. They'll use whatever cover they can and then they'll crouch down and wait for the prey to come to them. Run after it of a very, there we go, there we go, coming towards us. So I just watched the little Daco run away. It has escaped. So no dinner that easy for this leopard. I have a feeling this leopard is going to come straight back to us and carry on looking after his monitor lizard. Let's see what happens. All right, and that is over for that particular hunt. So from this particular live broadcast, we're going to be saying goodbye to you. Remember, you can watch us on wildsafarilive.com and uh, see you soon. that exciting please excuse me again on that uh, <laughs> I must be honest trying to do these uh, these uh, uh, unscheduled broadcasts from inside a scheduled broadcast is 
It's quite special. Though. <laughs> All right, so I actually think what's going to happen is this leopard is going to come back here and come straight back to this monitor lizard. But we're going to wait for him to stroke his ego a little bit over there and then we'll come, well, if he comes back, we'll call you back. In the meantime, Scott's got something very exciting happening in the Mara. Hello everyone, good to have you back, albeit surprisingly quickly. And apologies for the small technical glitch there. Um, we've just left Malaika and her two boys, a family of cheetah, behind, behind us. Um, they're full bellied, they apparently killed a wildebeest yesterday evening and they're still looking quite uncomfortably full. So we've headed off to see if we can't work out where these five males could be, the Musketeer Coalition, because we have heard mixed reports that they could be here, they could be there, so either way, the only way we're going to have a chance of finding them is by driving around and searching. So that's our plans. It sounds like you've been having a wonderful time with Steph and Hosanna. Looking forward to having a look at that monitor lizard interaction a bit later it's turning out to be a beautiful evening it's cooled off now thankfully when we headed out earlier this afternoon it was quite warm so enjoying the cool relief of the clouds very very marvelous it's quite interesting we're getting to a point now where we or at least i am having spent three months, a lot of, of which in this general area of the reserve or of the whole Mara. And it's quite nice getting to slowly getting to know the areas. I remember the Musketeer Coalition early one morning climbing up that tree over to our right there. The one at kind of between two and three o'clock and doing some scent marking. That was just after we had some beautiful silhouetted views of them. Some of you may have seen my photographs of that. So quite nice to get to know the area. And by getting to know the area, it's going to increase our chances of being able to find you guys animals. Because now I know even if the males, I don't know their exact whereabouts, I know a few of their kind of routes that they like to use. So I'm gonna explore a few of those routes that I've seen them travel on before. And while we do that, we are gonna send you traveling across to James. Here we are, still with our cubbies. We're not going anywhere from them. We won't be shining a light on them. We don't have to, we've got infrared light here. So I don't think we're going to leave here for the next three days. I mean, I don't obviously mean that, but we're definitely going to come back here and check on them over the course of the next three days or so. Because this is just too magical. There's a bit of feeding going on. There's a lot of playing going on. There are a lot of flies around, most of which are going to die fairly shortly at my end. I'm just trying to sex them and see what genders we have here. I, I mean, it's very difficult at this age, but it is possible when they lift their tails for long enough. We've definitely got at least one male. I mean, the ratio should be four or five of one or the other. And the reason I think that there might be, normally of course lion cubs introduce the pride at about six months, not six months, six weeks. And the reason I think they're a bit younger here is that this is the actual den site. And this is where their mothers gave birth to them apparently. So I think we've been very lucky to catch them at this age. And I think Brent, Brent saw them I'm sure it was last week or the week before. So, I mean, he's seen them even smaller than this. And just such a privilege to be able to come and watch them at this age. It's not often that we get to sit with lion cubs of this age. And we've also been granted very special privilege, courtesy of 
the Masai Mara National Reserve uh, to come and view them when nobody else is actually allowed to. Oh, and as the light comes out, the whole thing becomes that much more beautiful, if it could possibly. There's such a quiet, peaceful atmosphere. Nikki, you want to know if males ever leave the females or females ever leave the males because of close bonds? I'm, I'm not really sure what you mean there other than to say, you know, brothers or males will leave the pride, uh, we think, in order to uh, reduce the chances of... Uh, of inbreeding, so I mean cats can inbreed and do it without any harm uh, up to apparently about six generations. I'm not sure how often that's been worked out or how often it's been tried but it is absolutely possible and so what you have here is a situation where yes let's say there are four males here and five females, if the four males grow up to be sort of three years old, they will start to um, show amorous intent, shall we say, to their sisters and to their mothers and aunts. And it's at that point that the males will chase them out. Not because the males necessarily have any insight into the trials and tribulations of incest, but because they don't want to have the competition. And so that's how lion society has made things work. And in the, with the leopards, for example, males normally disperse quite a long way from their female from their mother's territories. Ferg, the one stalking up now has got himself covered in mud. <laughs> He's obviously quite adventurous. He or she. Look at the stalking already at this age. Sean, you're wondering if lions protect each other during the birthing process. So, you know, when these lionesses were giving birth, were the others standing around in protection? Almost certainly not. They are not the most, you know, although they're tremendously affectionate with each other sometimes, they do not look after each other in anything like the same way that wild dogs or um, wolves would look after each other. So, you know, if, they, if one was giving birth and a big ma marauding male lion or massive clan of hyenas came bungling in, yeah, you know, they would defend it in the sa they would defend her to the same extent that they might defend a kill. So it wouldn't be, uh, not to the extent of injuring themselves, and there wouldn't have been anybody sort of sitting guard while she gave birth. I've spotted at least two males now. There's two, those two, yes, that you're watching there are males, I think. <laughs> this is just great stuff. I'm not sure why the one poor mother is being attacked so much more than the other, but when we found them, it looked to me quite a lot like one lioness had much more swollen teeth than the other and I wonder if she isn't lactating more and therefore having to bear the brunt of the suckling duties. Listen to them complaining. I wonder where the other lioness is. Maybe she's gone off hunting. These cubs are too young to go to a kill now, so when the lionesses leave, they will go off back into. I've never seen a lioness, a lion suckling like that, like a little impala. When the lionesses leave, the cubs will go back into the hole in the rocks here. We've got a Cape turtle dove in the background, or ring neck dove calling bit of wind blowing. A wind very seldom stops for any length of time in this area. And as I said during our recent TV show, the smell of sort of half goat and half cattle that used to sort of fill the air has now dissipated. And it's been replaced by a smell of the grass. 
tomato, of course, is one of my very favorite smells. Nikki, you want to know if the mothers show bias to the male cubs? Uh, no, I don't think they do at all. Um, I don't think they show bias to any of the cubs. I don't think they, I mean, they don't even show bias to their own cubs over uh, those of, uh, you know, of their siblings. So these two lionesses are most likely, if they're not cousins, if they're not sisters, they're certainly cousins, they'll cross-suckle each other's cubs, and I don't believe that they show favoritism to any of them. And I'm not even convinced that they know after a certain period which ones are theirs and which ones aren't. That said, of course, they can recognize their individual calls when they're adults, so I don't know what the story is as far as, um, you know, as far as them being able to recognize their own cubs is. But because they cross-suckle, I suspect that they don't really, they don't really differentiate. <laughs> the colors keep changing here, of course, because the light keeps going behind a cloud and then back out again. And mercifully, Fergus and I have stayed uh, out of the rain today, haven't we, Fergus? We had one very brief little drizzle very early on, uh, but we seem to have escaped it for now, which is great news indeed. Right, I believe that uh, Hosanna has managed to escape out of whatever thicket that he was stalking his diker in, and I am hoping that he will possibly go on the stalk again, perhaps as it gets a little bit darker, but Stefan Winterboer, the mystic boer, will tell you all about that now. Welcome back everyone, and we've managed to find and relocate this uh, this leopard with uh, Aubrey's help. He missed his kill and is now just relaxing on the bank of the strainers on about a hundred yards or so from us. and. Uh, there's a lot of elephant in this area and I think he's just busy making sure he doesn't get caught in a position where he can't uh, get himself out of. Um, very relaxed at the moment, I think with the exception of just having a bit of a bruised ego for missing dinner. Oh, he is in good condition, eh? wow. Loving the fact that he's so active. He's left those monitor lizards that he was hunting still very alert to what's going on in his surroundings. These ellies are going to have an effect on clearing the bush out in front of them. So any little, any little antelope that's around or any morsel, these elephants will flush out of the, uh, out of the bushes and hopefully into the waiting mouth, I think. It's quite nice following around elephant for leopard. You see it quite often in leopard following around large boned herbivores, elephant in particular, buffalo, sometimes rhino as well. Here you can see, watching just past us, lots of ellies around. Elena, who's only 14 years old, has asked a nice question. Is the coat, is the skin underneath the coat of a leopard the same rosette pattern? Um, not that I've ever seen, Elena. I've seen a few leopard skins that have lost their fur, and uh, quite often they're just this uniform sort of tan color without that rosette on. But I've never seen a fresh leopard fur. In other words, I've never seen a, a shaved leopard. And so, difficult to, uh, to answer your question. I can only draw it from my own experience. I've also only ever touched a live leopard once. It was a leopard that was darted uh, and uh, a collar was fitted for a scientific purpose. And I stroked the leopard. I didn't think to open up its fur to see what color its skin was, unfortunately, Delilah. Sorry about that. But I would imagine it's just a uniform color, very similar to a lion's, a lion's coat or lion skin, which is this sort of grayish color. You can see how camouflaged it is there, isn't it wonderful? 
just the white chest sticking out. And that necklace of dots around the head. Really beautiful. A peaceful sighting. I mean, this leopard has got all the bush in the world you can see to hide away in, and it's, we've just been very, very fortunate to have the sighting that we've had of one of the most elusive of the big, definitely the most elusive of the big five, which is a very difficult thing to, uh, to see in most African parks, this being one of the best areas in the world to see leopard. He's lovely, eh? Just every now and again, something catching his attention. Leopard, he's looking very healthy. He's he's got a he's got a fairly full belly, not not as full as what it can get. He's not empty, and. Um, I probably find that he could do with a meal. He won't say no to it, but he's not desperate for a meal at the moment. Now, Michelle, who's also only 14 years old, has asked a question, would Hosanna mate with his sister, Shungila, if there were no other leopards uh, available? Now, the answer to that question is yes, and they would. A female leopard will not, if she can possibly, her body won't allow her to go through an estrus cycle if she can find a male, even if that male is a blood relative. And I know that sounds a bit weird, but in the, these leopards' genetic pool is very deep at the moment, and they can withstand a couple of generations of inbreeding. If a population had to get isolated or go down to a few individuals for whatever reason, for disease, for, um, for geographic isolation because of some event, a flooding for instance, or you know, volcanic activity or an earthquake, and, um, and it's absolutely feasible that leopard would would uh, would mate with their own with their own blood relatives what's this leopard stalking in now again but if and only if are we about to see another hunt can you believe it this is the third hunt of the day from this leopard and probably the last hour that very intense day and get yourselves ready for the pounce what are you going to do now? What is it that you've got? Is it going to be third time lucky? Hold thumbs everyone. You can feel the pressure building. Come on. Are you going to put that foot down? It's balancing just on one leg at the moment. It looks like a... Eh? Look at the camouflage on the back of that cat. Isn't it just absolutely fantastic? Now, I must tell you that this is happening in the middle of a herd of elephant. We've got elephants surrounding us almost 360 degrees. What are you looking at? And just before the pounce, we're going to see that settling of the hips as the feet get planted. Oh, what's happening? Foot goes down. That relaxed posture. Been, he's been balancing on one front foot the whole time without even a shudder. Muscle density roughly 10 times that of a human and so they've got a lot of muscle packed into that small body. They're capable of carrying their own body weight. Yeah, you can see just Settling again, you can see those hips. Come on, boy. You can do that. Is he going to go? You can see that settling of the hips. Look at that. Those feet, at those back feet, you can see just pawing down on the earth. We're going to watch that piece of grass now erupt into a blur of motion. Come on. 
uh, looking down, seeing if he can move. Obviously, this prey, whatever it is, is moving away slightly. Tell him if the space that he's moving into, he can do it. Got a rough, a fringe of very sensitive whiskers on his face. Allow him to judge gaps in the undergrowth. And you can see that hips wobbling. That's what I keep on saying. He's on the verge of pouncing. You can see that. There he goes. What are you going to do? Wow, that camouflage is amazing. Ooh, edge of the seat stuff, eh? I must say, uh, myself and Senza are also on the edge of our seat over here, and I think everyone else. Come on, what are you going to do? Are you going to jump now? Or are you going to try and wedge your way through those sticks and risk exposing yourself? Or are you just going to take a leap of faith and clear those branches in front of you? It would be uncommon for this leopard to jump over those bushes unless there was no other avenue left open to it. Generally, they like to keep all four paws on the ground if they possibly can. It also allows them to change direction. Of course, as he breaks cover, whatever was looking at him or whatever he's hunting is also going to make a go for it. I'll be able to jink around. I still can't see what it is. Could be anything from a bird to a snake. Sorry, Louise, just uh, repeat Dina and Billy's question there, if you don't mind. Yeah. Buddy, you've just... Excuse me, I, uh, I didn't hear it first. She's saying, please go and get dinner, Hassan, and go and get it. And it's moved along? Oh, was it a scrub hare? So he was hunting another scrub hare, possibly even the same one that he missed a little bit earlier. He's darted off now. Now, Hosanna, this is the third time unlucky, boy. What's going on? I know, you think... Uh, yeah. You think that he'd have the dignity to flush a slight rosy red now, eh? But he is a youngster, and this is how they learn. He will only get better, can only get better. And he moves out. He obviously likes hunting these scrub hares. Okay, we're going to move forward a little bit to get into a better position so we don't lose him. position, what we're going to do is go over to the mara for some potential cheetah cubs in a bush. as well. Yeah. I'm going to go a bit along here, try to line up. Here we are again, still with the, well, what are they called again? I nearly call them leopards now, and leopards of course I was thinking about Osana. We're still with the lions, but what you can see now is that we have got three lionesses, not just two. The other one came up while you were watching Hosanna on his umpteenth attempt at killing something today. And she too has got into the business of suckling. Now she came from down below in a drainage line. I don't know what she was doing down there, possibly just having some lone time, a spa day to herself. But she's back into parenting as we speak. And none of them look particularly well fed. Which bodes well for the evening once it gets a little bit darker. Now, I must just tell you that we have 
we'll probably not be doing a huge amount of after dark stuff unless we get some really good action and that's simply because our moonlit or special low light cameras have had to go back home to where they where they belong but we certainly if we're sitting with these cats and they get up and they go on the hunt we'll follow them for as long as we can now interestingly here this lioness that is sort of cleaning its its cub or its niece or nephew is doing that phlegm and grimace as well. She's also lifting her, um, every time she sort of uh, gets too close to the rear end, she does the phlegm and grimace, which interprets, well, various things from the, I guess the genitalia, if you like. And I think it's just a default reaction to inter for interpreting uh, various hormones. so peaceful now, doesn't it? Here comes another one out of the water, folk. Coming back towards the melee. Very gentle melee, that it is. With them little playing here, it's just too precious. <laughs> Almost with no sort of thinking about the consequences of what they're doing. Just falling over each other. Perhaps in the knowledge that they're not big or nasty enough to actually do any real damage just yet. Eating bits of grass, testing little bits now. And I'm sure as the wind starts to blow, I think they're enjoying the warmth coming off this rock. Oh no, that's too sweet. The perfect little hidey hole here, safe in the rocks from any other predators, a bit of water for them to drink, nice and warm when it gets chilly at night. And of course the warmth of nine little cubs sitting next to each other and in a sort of carpet must be very special on a cold night. They really do look like teddy bears at this stage of their lives. And unfortunately, they do grow up so fast. Steffi, you're wondering how they protect their cubs at night. Well, Steffi, only through either being here or um, by, you know, fighting off whatever might come this way. But what will happen, Steffi, is that when they go off hunting, the cubs will disappear into the rocks here. And they'll be invisible to anything but a, uh, well, but maybe a hyena that came looking, a hyena be able to smell them. But they'll be in a hole, I suspect, too small for a hyena to get at them. And so they would probably be entirely safe. And so the best protection that can be offered during the night if the lionesses are off hunting is for them to be left alone in the den. I also think, and I have never read this, so I'm not sure, that the fastidious cleaning that you see going on here is a way of making them smell less. So although I'm sure they do have a scent to a sensitive nose like a hyena's, they are not tremendously smelly creatures. Look at this little curious little thing coming up towards us. I think a lot of predators that might otherwise harm the cubs would just walk on by here and not even realize that they were around. They would definitely smell the adults, I suspect. Now, I believe Brent Leo Smith has managed to find some cubs of his own. Whether he has any communication or not is another matter. Let's find out. Very exciting, everyone. This is definitely one of the things I've been looking forward to most in the Maasai Mara. And we've been mountaineering, we've been climbing. Now you're going to have to look very, very carefully into the center of the shot. And every now and then you will see some movement. Now there is a female cheetah's tail flicking. But watch carefully. Every now and then you just get the vision of the tiniest, tiny cheetah cub. I mean, half the size of a domestic.
domestic cat. These things are minute, days rather than weeks old, hidden right up against the escarpment. I'm not sure which female this is. Look there, look, look, look. There is one, look how small it is. Oh my goodness. It is just to die for. Those things, they can't even walk. Their eyes are pretty much closed still. These are days, days, days old. Manu and I are just too excited. Now, she has chosen the most splendid den site, in my opinion, due to the fact of all the nasty lions and hyenas around and leopards. She has chosen a spot. Now, Final Control is struggling to see them, but I know you guys can see those tiny little tails whipping. One just climbed over, so you've got to look carefully. I mean, these things are tiny. They are minute. This is, these are the smallest cheetah cubs I've ever seen in the wild, put it that way. And I've been living in big five game reserves with cheetah since I was four years old, and this is the smallest cheetah cub I have ever seen. Now, there's at least two that I can see so far. I said, you just got to look very carefully right in the center frame. Well, the one cub moved up towards the left, towards the green bush. There seems to be another one still scrambling around mum. Janet, cuteness and overload indeed, even though we're not getting the best visuals of these cheetah cubs, which is not a bad thing. The, the fact that this den is inex so inaccessible to everyone is a very, very good. Um, now, I'm going to... We'll, we'll, we'll zoom in again. I'm just going to get Manu to show you how inaccessible this den really is. So as we come wider and wider and wider... Now, to give you an idea where we are, I'm probably a quarter of the way up. Um, I'm very high and it's still about another three or four hundred meters all the way down to the flat. Now we will be keep trying to see what happens next with uh, this incredible, it's almost a once in a lifetime sighting. Uh, while we do that, we're going to go all the way back to Juma. Let's have one last quick look. See if we can spot one of those bundles of joy. But as I say, it is a difficult spot. So let's go across to Steph. Have a look at this special, special sighting. We've got two rock monitors having a bit of a wrestle. The guy on top now is the male. He's trying to get the female into a position where he can mate with her. She's having none of it. She wants none, nothing to do with him. And isn't this weird? This is not the same pair that the leopard was hunting just now. This is a different pair, but in exactly the same area. We're about 50 yards or so apart. You can see What's happening now is this female's got this male's hips and so he can't get around, he can't move around her, so he's, he's in a bit of a lock. She's got him subdued. <laughs> he's looking like he's overpowering her slowly but surely. She's lost her grip of his hips and what he's trying to do is force her underneath him. She's going to try and get out of the way now. She might spin and try and run for it. Are you trying to bite her leg? Oh, oh, what are you doing? That's not the way to treat a lady. Yeah, she must bite him back. She's in the perfect spot. What are you doing? Well, that's, dislocating your girlfriend's hip is not the best way to go about it. Stop that. Steffi, you say it looks complicated. It, it absolutely is. He obviously isn't the best male around, and this female doesn't want anything to do with him. Or she's playing a little bit of hard to get, which is giving other males in the area the chance to come and usurp this guy. Eventually what will happen is her body will tell her, look, this is, no, no, what are you doing? That's not the way. Just because you're not getting your way doesn't mean you have to do that. Uh, she's giving him some... Well, she'll give another bigger male the chance to usurp this one. What he needs to do is realize that biting a leg off... No, 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 no. Come now. 
he needs to let go of his grip there. Yeah, she's got out of it. Good. He's trying to hold on desperately. Missed it. Now he'll chase her down. <laughs> and into that thick bush. Look at the elephant in the background. Sorry, uh, Louise, would you repeat uh, Dino's, uh, Dino's question, please? Oh, yes, Dino, absolutely. Spring is in there. Yeah, they've come out this side now in front of us. Let's see if the male catches him. Spring is definitely in there. Absolutely, Dino. Looks like this female actually got away. No, he's still in tow. I'll come out of this bush now. There you can see him, tired. Tongue flicking out, looking for her. I think she's made good her escape, actually. Let's see what happens here when he catches up with her. Obviously, she won't be able to get too far. She's leaving a pheromone trail that he can follow using scent. No, he's lost her. He's going around in circles here. Senza is just... She can... Senza can see her. She's playing... She's gotten away. <laughs> Lost out, my friend. It's because you want to be so abusive, that's why. That is not cool. Oh, excuse my bald head getting in your shot. See, he's almost desperate trying to find her. Look at the way he's flicking his tongue out. He's coming right past the car. Africa's Komodo dragon. Only the water monitor is longer. There she is somewhere there. And she's just counting her lucky stars at the moment. There he goes. He's going to backtrack, I think, from the last position. We'll stick with him and see if he manages to refind her again. Let's see how determined he is. Yeah, he's picking up the scent now. Oh, you can see how almost frantic he is, eh? Becky, you'd like to know if these lizards are poisonous. Um, so they are related to the Komodo dragon, which has a saliva harboring a lot of bacteria. And that saliva, there goes the female there. Come on, get away now. That saliva is, uh, can convey uh, toxins which will cause septicemia and eventually death in the Komodo dragon. These lizards will give you a nasty bite. They've got these peg-like teeth and can give a nasty bite. Um, and can also infect you with a type of bacteria, but they don't have the same bacteria that lives in the mouth of the Komodo dragon. This will be by chance. In other words, the bite will be, uh, will, will be, will infect you by chance rather than by design as it is in the Komodo dragon. So no, these are not venomous. Um, they don't have any venom glands either. They're not like the Gila monster uh, which has venom, venomous saliva or, or venom that they produce in their saliva either. So this would just be an infected bite because their mouths are full of nasty bacteria rather than anything else. He is trying his best to get her. She's now walked off completely opposite direction, heading towards some elephant. Let's see if he's on her trail. No, he's lost her. Wow, what a good escape. Look at him. <laughs> that gait that they have is just so amazing. Like a big bodybuilder. Strutting his stuff and flexing his muscle. The reason why they mate now is because it takes almost an entire year for the eggs to incubate. They incubate under the ground and they hatch out a year later uh, when the sun warms up the earth and when water softens the ground that the eggs have been laid in. So. They mate now and they'll dig their eggs into the ground when the first rains fall and then a year later they will, uh, they will then, the babies will hatch. 
uh, as soon as the ground gets wet again. Right, we're going to stick around and see if we can pull young Hosanna out of the bush over here with the help of Aubrey. And um, we're going to send you all the way north to Scott, who's looking for some cheetah. Well, we've temporarily stopped looking for cheetah because it's simply too beautiful not to show you the scene with zebra, wildebeest, one or two Thompson's gazelle dotted on the horizon. Absolutely marvelous. And it's been what sounds like an incredible drive. Some really interesting stuff's happened. And I must say, I'm a little bit jealous. Jealous. <laughs> Jelly babies of all the things you've seen. Jelly babies are a kind of sweet in South Africa. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting stuff going on. And now a beautiful, beautiful sunset scene. Also to the left, as Craig continues to pan to the left, you'll notice there's some rain falling from those clouds. And that rain is falling in Tanzania. And that is what is drawing these migrating herds back south. There you can see more clearly. So... It's easy to understand that they get clear signals from Mother Nature as to where the grass is going to be greener. Look at that beautiful scene there. Marvelous. Now we still have no idea where these five male cheetahs are that we're looking for. Hopefully they are somewhere in this general area. We've got a hold of as many people as we can to try and work out where they are. Failing that, at least we can head out tomorrow morning with the knowledge that we know where Malaika and her two boys are. And hopefully they'll be a little bit more hungry than they were this morning and we'll be able to see them in action. Let's take another little quick look at these zebra that are against the setting sun now that it's popped below the clouds. How cool is this? And the Maasai Mara certainly is one of the greatest wilderness destinations I've ever been that allows you views like this. There's just unobstructed vistas, often littered with game. And this is just too good to be true. It's a dead still evening. Slight, slight breeze, nice and cool. And a great privilege, privilege to be taking you guys out on a live safari and to be able to share moments like this with you. We are going to continue perusing though in the hope that we are going to find these cheetah. Even though the sun is setting, these five males have done a lot of the hunting after dark. So it's not to say we might not still catch them in a fortunate position to see them doing their business. Okay, well you guys are going to head off back to James to get an update on how those cubs are getting along. See you later. Well, before we do the cubs, we're going to just have a look at the sun because it's very, very pretty indeed. Isn't that lovely? It's just disappearing over the horizon. There it is. Gorgeous stuff. Very nice, Fergus rain in the background that we have managed to avoid so far. Doesn't that make you feel good about the world? It certainly makes me feel good about the world that I've managed to avoid that rain. And we'll go back to the beautiful cubs. Unfortunately they're not sitting in a position where we're going to be able to see the sun's rays catching them, unfortunately. There we are. But we're just having a very pleasant afternoon enjoying them. One or two have found the excesses of the afternoon slightly too exhausting and they've started to close their eyes and go back to sleep. Mums have also sort of shut their eyes. I predict what is going to happen here is that they will wait for pretty much until it's pitch black before possibly going off on the hunt. But because the cubs are here, you might find they even wait longer than that and don't go on the hunt at all until much later. But we'll wait and see. I think it's much easier. It's been noticeably easier for the two lionesses since the third one arrived. They're all sharing the duties now. Also, the cubs are getting a little bit tired. And so they're starting to go to sleep. Look at that. 
Well, Steffi, you say what you'd give to see this in person. Well, of course, you have the choice to do that in person. If you uh, sell your left kidney or something on the black market, I'm sure you could uh, get enough to come through here. I'm obviously being deeply facetious right now. Um, but, yeah, uh, Steffi, it is a bucket list thing for so many people, and many save for years and years to come out on a one-time safari to Africa. Of course, it's not the cheapest holiday you can have, but it is, I mean, it is a once-in-a-lifetime experience to come and see something like this live. But you've got the next best thing. You're watching it as it's happening, as it's unfolding right now in the Masai Mara and, of course, the hunting going on in the Kruger National Park, all completely live, which means it's just about the same as being here. Not quite, but just about. He says, like somebody put a smile on the cub's face. I must say, I agree with you. I think that the cubs do look a lot more cheerful than their mothers and their aunts. I, I think than all adults, you know, all the adult lions tend to look a little bit serious about life. It's very difficult to take a cub seriously, even when it's growling. Oh, this is precious. Just like little kids, they want to be involved with everything. What are you drinking now? Okay, why? Why are you drinking that? Can I have some? I don't like this. I want something else that I like. What do you feel like? I don't know. Something nice. That's what's going on here. And Onko, you're absolutely right. These cubs completely adore their mother's tales. You say the world's best toy. Yes, absolutely. They do seem to be the source of the most fascination for all of these youngsters. There it is, with its little pom-pom on the end of it. I loved pom-poms as a kid as well. Now that lioness once we've looked at the cubs, I think the cubs are a bit more entertaining. I will just tell you that the lioness is, oh, she was, she's not anymore. She was giving that sort of nuzzling of the head to her cohorts, perhaps as if to say, come on, chaps, let's go and get some supper. It looks like it's going to get dark fairly soon. This is often a precursor to hunting. we might just be grateful to sit here with the cat cubs for a bit longer because of course as soon as the lionesses disappear that will be the end of our cub time. Very faintly in the background I can hear the sounds of baby Franklins calling their mums. It's a high-pitched whistle so incongruous because they sound nothing like the adults do at all. Anyway, there are our cubs having a good play again. Thoroughly enjoying themselves almost as much as we're enjoying them. I'm extremely grateful to have found these little things. It's been a very long time since I've spent this amount of time little lion cubs. Here comes one stalking Fergus to the left. There we are. Then thought better of it. Noticeable difference in size, but I promise you in a few weeks time you won't be able to know the difference between them. Did you say, well they eat meat as well at this stage? Yeem. The weaning process will start now at about six weeks though, so yes, if there is meat around, they will possibly start to eat it. And at six weeks, they're old enough to be led to a kill and then led back here. But I don't think, I mean, I think, like I said, I don't think the little ones are that old yet. I think the oldest ones are probably six weeks, six to, mm, I did say eight weeks, maybe up to eight weeks old. So yes, they would certainly be eating bits and pieces of meat. And then, in theory, they should be completely weaned by six months. Oh, look.
look at that. Now, before it gets too dark, I'm going to hand you back to Brent and his honey badger cubs. Well, they look like honey badgers, don't they? <laughs> In the long grass, and hopefully they'll move around a bit as it gets a bit darker. Well, James, uh, James is spot on. They have a really pale back that mimics the grass, and that helps with their with their camouflage. So what we're doing is what we're going to do, because I know a lot of people are struggling to see them. I've just lost sight of them at the moment. But as soon as they move, we're going to put them... You got them? There we go, bottom right. So we're going to put them right in the bottom right-hand corner. There's a little dark patch there. Now just keep your eyes focused. There we go. See the little cup moving? It's, it's so dark that it hasn't even really got that honey badger um, white back yet. So, I mean, these, I, I would say, two, three, maybe four days old. Look at that little tail. Completely black. Oh, he's just crawled into the little thicket. Now, I'm hoping you guys did manage to see that there. So, in the bottom right corner, if you scroll back a little bit and look very carefully, there's the most tiny cheetah cub I have ever seen in my life. Now, there's at least two that we can make out. Mom is sleeping in there. Now, I'm pretty sure Mom is going to be here for the whole night, and we're not going to hang around too long. Um, we are going to give her the opportunity. Look, oh, there's movement there, bottom right again. And it looks like the second cub. So there's at least two that we can make out. There we go. Look, look, look. Look at that. so tiny. It's so tiny. I would say, I mean, half the size of a big domestic cat. Now, that's a big, wild African cat that is so small, half the size of a domestic cat. Now, of course, it is. this is the best spot we can see them from. It is an excellent spot that mom's chosen for a den there. There's lots of, there's a bit, actually some rocks and some crevices where the cubs can hide. And there's an unlikely that cheetah, uh, that hyenas and, and other predators. Oh, there we go, but more movement again. We'll have to, we'll move into this area. small it is look how small it is it can barely walk look at it oh it fell over oh my goodness bottom right hand corner guys if you're wondering what i'm looking at there we go there's another one on the way uh mia from illinois is wondering is that site not uh, it will keep them dry most definitely the rain will, will, will tumble through there and as i said there's lots of rocks and crevices that they can hide in Oh my goodness, they are tiny. They, 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 I think their eyes still might be closed. They, they, they're stumbling over. They can't walk. They're groping around by feel. There we go. There's movement again. Look, look, you can see the white back that James was talking about. The same color as the grass. This is absolutely amazing. Now, I've only ever found cubs younger than this once before in my whole life, and that was, of course, Hosanna and Shongile. Oh, look at it. He's crawling back. Well, she, I can't, they definitely can't tell. They are minute. This is so special. This is something you very, very rarely ever get to experience or see. Often when you find cubs, they're normally a month old and six weeks old. But to find them at this age, days, mere days old. Oh my goodness, that just melts my heart. 
Well, I'm definitely going to be back here tomorrow morning to check what's happening. But at the moment, as it gets darker, I'm going to leave the Cheetah family to be. Hopefully, in the bright early morning light, we'll be able to see a little bit more tomorrow. This is just so exciting. But, uh, well, we leave our little Cheetah family. Uh, we're going to go across to Scott, who's still in search of five much larger, much more fearsome Cheetah on the other side of the river. Well, isn't that such exciting news? I didn't realize there were such tiny cheetah cubs. I got a little bit confused and kind of presumed it was another female cheetah with cubs that are probably be about two or three months old now. So well done to Brent and such, such good prospects for the coming days. Hopefully, like Brent says, tomorrow morning he'll be able to track them down for you and get you some better views. I've never seen tiny, tiny cheetah cubs like that, so I'm looking forward to seeing what action unfolds there. We have had no major luck or changes in information updates regarding the male cheetah. So we just continued to peruse an area where we could bump into them. I've seen them here before. I've also seen a pride of lion here before. So could bump into either of the two. Actually on one occasion, the lion chased the cheetah. Sadly, it was in a low signal area. So I don't think we could share it with you. It was quite interesting, actually. After the cheetah got the initial frights, when the lion kind of ambushed them, they scattered a little bit, they just lay down and watched the lion from like 30 meters away because they knew once they had their eyes locked in it, they had nothing to worry about. They backed their speed. So they were kind of almost taunting it, which is quite interesting. So the plan is, just for, the, for you guys to know, for the next few days, is that Craig and I will be staying here for three nights, this being the first of the three. So even though we didn't succeed greatly in getting any cheetah action this evening, we still have a few more sleeps in this area. And I guess, as Brent has clearly indicated to you, there's not the only cheetah in the Mara are on this side of the river. There's also a few on the triangle side. And just to give those of you who don't know exactly how the Mara Reserve works, a quick overview. The Mara Triangle is on the western side of the Mara River up to the Olololo Escarpment. The Mara Reserve is on the eastern side of the Mara River up into the surrounding community conservancies that border the kind of north and eastern section of the park. So it's kind of broken up into a few different chunks. Well, this is where often we have spotted some lion. We're usually just racing past them to get to the cheetah. And last time I saw, they did have a few cubs. So that would be a nice little bonus. Although you guys have already seen some lion cubs with James this afternoon, cheetah cubs with Brent, so lots and lots of action. Leopard with Steph. What an awesome afternoon. Getting one or two raindrops, but I don't think it's gonna cause any trouble. So we should be able to continue unaffected. It's actually quite welcoming having a few cool raindrops. Hit the flesh. It was incredibly hot when we headed out this afternoon. Hello, Ali, you'd like to know if it ever gets very dry in the Mara? And yes, it certainly does. This, in theory, should be the driest it gets. But I don't think we are... I don't think what we are seeing at the moment is normal from year to year. There's been a lot more rain in the last few months than there ordinarily would be at this time of the year. So I think there's a bit more green around than there should be. Having said that, I'm no Mara expert. This is my first few months spent in the area. But yes, it certainly does have its drier times. And you would guess it would be between the long rains and the short rains. The long rains finish in kind of March, April. So May, June, July, August, September, October. Kind of seven month, six, seven month dry season. And then the short rains in November should give a little bit of life and longevity just to last until the long rains in March, April.
What's interesting is that this side of the reserve alley is quite green at the moment, especially compared to the side that, of the reserve that Brent's on. And what's also been interesting on top of that is from week to week it does fluctuate from area to area, just depending on the localized rainfall any area may have been lucky enough to get. Come on, lions or cheetah or leopard or anything. So I'm possibly thinking of throwing in the towel a little bit early tonight. Um, with the planning that we head out first thing tomorrow morning, a little bit earlier than normal, to try and start foraging for action. And seeing as though James, Brent and Steph are all out, I'm sure they'll be able to continue to show you a good time. So that's also one of my plans, possibly to get an early night. Oh, a raindrop just hit me right below the eye, quite a big one. Ding! <laughs> So those are my plans, and you'll be glad to know... Oh, another raindrop just pelted me. Can you see it there? Right below the eye. It was quite a good shot from Mother Nature. You see it? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Anyway, what you can see now is some tiny, cute little lion cubs under the glow of an infrared light with James. Well, we're not quite in infrared just yet, uh, but we certainly are going to have to be fairly soon. I'm hoping the rain will avoid us. I did stupidly tempt it by saying earlier, this is the first time we've ever escaped the rain. And I think that, uh, well, the universe is going to spit upon me, literally and, of course, figuratively. As we sit here watching our little lion cubs, everything has calmed down here. Everyone is calm and wanting to have a little bit of a snooze after the excesses of the day. Anyway, we'll see what happens while we sit here. The mother's showing no signs of going hunting at this stage. And I'm I'm quite interested by that. I, I would have thought by now they were showing signs, they would have been showing signs of getting up. We've got quite a full moon tonight, it's about three quarters. And that won't be good for them hunting, they prefer the full darkness. And I haven't seen hide nor hair of anything they could hunt around this area. Also what's interesting of course is that these cubs are so little at the moment that they can't even make that kind of um, that growling sound that they make. They can only sort of squeak like little birds. Now what we're doing now with it getting this dark is quite special for us because of the IR that we have. Often, in fact normally we'd have to leave them by now. And then a question from a cheese potato. Yes, cheese potato. Uh, you <laughs> cheese potato, you want to know if lion cubs uh, will be attacked by other animals? Yes, they'll be killed by hyenas. Leopards would take them. Wild dogs would kill them if they could. Uh, big eagles would take them if they could as well. So absolutely things will try and take uh, a lion cub if they can. So largely, of course, the predators will do it in order to try and avoid a competition. That lioness is hungry and she spotted something. I cannot see what it is. Maybe she's picked something up on the wind. She's turned her face into the wind. She certainly looks like something is up. That's 
where she's looking. And of course the other thing that will kill little lion cubs are marauding males. I don't think there are many of those around here. And this is generally how it goes when they get up. They get up and you think, oh, here we go, and then sit down again and have another just 20 minutes or so of sleep, and then get up and then move around, oh, and then have a little sleep. My phone is talking to me, I'm sorry everybody, every so often it gets a bee in its bonnet and decides to have a conversation with me. <laughs> that was Siri. Um, sorry, can we have that again from Bev, please? <laughs> oh, Bev, you want to know, will the hunt hunting, will the lioness go hunting while I'm here? Uh, yes, absolutely she would. Uh, the, she's not even reacting to us at all. She's not looking towards us, she's looking away and around. We like one of these rocks and so she'd go off hunting, the cubs would go into their rock. They're not remaining here in order to protect the cubs. They don't see us as a threat or as something to eat, um, both of which are quite satisfying situations to find yourself in. I wouldn't really like it if a lioness like that saw me as something to eat. Right, as you were, Fergus. Put on the infrared. Here we go, everybody. There we are. Now, I don't know if we've done it yet in the final control, but the picture for me is green. And it's a rather sickly green, so what we do is we, we pull the saturation out of it and so you see a black and white image, which is a much more attractive image than the one that we're looking at now. I'm not sure why infrared translates as a green to the cameras. Do you know, Fergus? Movies, I think for some reason in sort of war movies, the, um, the special forces had green infrared. And is that why it's green? Mm. You mean it's an effect? Oh, it's actually an effect that the camera puts on, apparently. This Fergus. What a silly effect. It's actually red. Yes, I would have thought it was red. Fergus says it's red. Anyway, that's why it's black and white for you. Because too much of this green would make you feel nauseous. Now the actual infrared light is not on yet, that's just infrared sort of sucking the last light out of what there is in the ambient and then this. <laughs> and then uh, 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 this, no, we've got a loose connection here we'll have to sort out. <laughs> it was almost so perfectly worked out Fergus. Now, a very good question from Ray Lee here, wondering how on earth these lionesses managed to get these naughty cubs to stay in one place when they go off hunting. And I mean, this is a question that a lot of people ask. It's not necessarily a very easy one to answer because no one really knows. When they're this little, I don't think it's that hard. When they're this small, um, they tend to uh, they just go, you know, as soon as the mothers move too far away from comfort, they give them a little growl or something like that, and then they'll disappear down into the hole that they live in. Uh, but when they get a bit bigger, and I don't know if any of you were on the hunt with us yesterday evening with the sausage tree pride, it becomes a lot more difficult for them to make the cubs stay behind. Sometimes they give them a bit of a growl, sometimes they can get pretty aggressive with them. But once they get to sort of around about, oh, I don't know, say 10 to 12 months old, they become a hazard in a hunt. And they're much more difficult, I think, to, to discipline into staying behind. But I suspect there's some kind of body language or signal that they give the cubs, and the cubs kind of understand it. Now, the lioness is one of them is certainly starting to look a bit restless. Focus, do we need to fix that thing or... Oops! Oh, here we go. What have we got going on here? This looks quite interesting. Sorry, that's my hat, everyone. I'm just going to duck out the way. There 
is something that they can see. Ferg, how much is that light going to come on or not? Do you think we're all right still? James, you're wondering if they'll use these rocks to hunt from and around. Absolutely, they will. They'll use a vehicle sometimes. They'll use whatever cover they can, especially in an area like this. Now, there's a bush directly in front of what we are trying to look at. So I can't see what she can see behind that bush. Two of them are looking now. I'm just going to try, excuse the ruffling and rustling, I'm just going to try and get my spotlight out. Uh, we're just going to head back across to Scott while we fix our infrared light and we'll be back with you shortly. Welcome back everyone. And exciting stuff with those lions prowling about. Our spotlight bulb just blew. Don't work no more. So I guess it's a sign that our decision to pack it in a little bit earlier was a good one because without a spotlight it'll be a little bit tricky to find things. And why don't we just stop here and show you some silhouettes of this beautiful big giraffe who you can see dotted on the horizon over there. Tricky. <laughs> I'm used to the other camera that we no longer have, sadly. That would have done a great job now. But the little ones we've got are better suited for the day. For, uh, Craig's just switched over onto the infrared so we can see him a little bit better. Marvelous! Well, off we go. And I hope you guys continue to have a wonderful safari for the last few minutes. We're only a kilometer or so away from what is called the Talek Gate. There are multiple gates that you can enter the reserve from. And we are staying at a beautiful little camp called Ol Shaiki, just upstream from the gate, outside of the reserve, but the Talek River is the border from the gate further to the east. So we look out across the Talek River into the reserve and it's a wonderfully situated camp, lots of big fig trees, quite a different feeling and atmosphere to our camp which is hugely different, situated up on the escarpment, both have their perks I guess like anything in life, the views from our camp are quite spectacular as are the little riverine forests and gullies and valleys that flow down from the escarpment into the reserve, a great place for us to explore while we're doing our little runs and exercise. Quite nice to be able to, well, incredibly fortunate to be able to, whoa, sorry, should have my lights on maybe, then I would have seen that hole. <laughs> um, like I say though, the, what was I saying actually? I've forgotten what I was saying before we dipped into that hole. Oh, running, running through the kind of outskirts or fringes of the reserve is absolutely awesome because you can bump into elephants or zebra, giraffe, impala, who knows. I haven't bumped into any ellies yet. It's always exciting bumping into ellies whilst exercising. Okay, well, it's been great having you on board. I look forward to being out on safari again with you guys tomorrow. Hopefully we'll find some cheetah. In the meantime, you're going to be sending back... Oops, I forgot the new rules. There's a... <laughs> There's a new plan when we link across back to Juma. And I'm getting used to it still. So I was about to scoot you off onto Steph's vehicle and you're about to go now. sighting of the Nkuhumas from this morning. Now, for those of you who didn't see this morning, we tracked and found the Nkuhumas, but we couldn't really get a good view of them. And because we were on foot, we made our way out, and Rex and the rest of the Juma guides came and had a look, and they moved into this area after we left them, and now we're coming to end the show, basically, with them. And judging from the tracks from this morning, I'm expecting to see very young lions here. I can't wait. Lion cubs are super awesome. Feels 
going to make our way slowly and I can really see some lines just next to us off on our right hand side. Get into a position where we can see all the lines that we want. Just slowly making our way in. Hello everybody. Have a look there. Brand spanking new lion cubs. <laughs> how epic is that? I couldn't believe how small their tracks were this morning and when we, when we had found them we were very nervous that the mother would come out of the bushes at us. But she seemed not to notice us and now we get to see and show you those the owners of the footprints that we showed you this morning excuse my voice coming through a little bit muffled there it's uh, me just getting excited and not realizing where my microphone was now look at them playing they've got a tail in the mouth Those lion cubs are about as big as teddy bears at the moment. They are tiny. They, they soccer ball size. A couple of weeks old, just been introduced to the pride. So anywhere from about six to about ten weeks old. That's how old these guys are. Um, I'm not actually sure if we've seen them before on the show. Uh, Senzo's telling me we have seen them before. So they're probably a little bit older than that. I definitely haven't seen them. And the lovely thing about seeing little difficult couple of uh, of months I went from a pride takeover where their cubs were killed to. Oh, ooh, this lioness is quite badly injured. Wow. Holy smokes. Since so I've just gone to this lioness here with a damaged hip. Have we seen this before? Have a look at that massive injury. Oh. It can only be a goring from something. Wow. Senzo, have we seen this lioness's injury before? Yes. Ah, so she's got an injury, okay. Senzo also says, update, excuse me, I'm a bit out of touch with everything at the moment. Now what are you gonna do? Hopefully the wind is not going straight towards us. This is the time of year when lions have it relatively easy. I'm just going for a potty break. Hopefully the wind is not blowing towards us. They're looking a bit skinny, these females, I must be honest with you. They're not in their best health, but you know, it's a very difficult thing to to produce milk for cubs. It's expensive from a metabolic point of view. I think what's happening is these lions are, they're not too bad. Lean, they could do with a meal for sure. And it's just, it's lovely to see. These females have had it hard. I mean, since we started, I must be honest with you that it's been, this pride has taken a bashing. And, uh, it is actually quite nice to see. Yeah. I'm glad everyone's saying that you're all excited to see the Nkoma part. She's blind in that eye as well. Wow, these girls have taken a hammering. Blind in the eye. One with a, a gash 
on the leg. Now Valerie, you're wondering if this lioness with a massive gash on her leg will survive. Well, with lions is you, you stick with the pride, you'll get fed for an adult lion. And that is what will happen. So if she manages to stick with the pride and she doesn't, she doesn't fall behind to a point where she's unable to, to get any food, then she will be looked after. She'll be welcome at, at kills. And I think she doesn't look too bad just yet. Believe me when I say that lions can, when they are injured and they're bad, it is, a, a skinny lioness is bad. Now I'm told that up to two weeks ago you've been seeing her and that she's been moving with the pride since then. And she's keeping it clean, she's licking it clean. Um, it doesn't look like her hip or anything's wrong with her hip. Wow, it looks bad that, but you know, she's okay. She's with the pride. That's all that matters. So to be honest with you, although it looks bad, lions can get much worse and, and it's not too bad. Oh, big yawn. The unfortunate would be that she's obviously not capable of hunting and so wouldn't be able to add her strength to the rest of the pride to uh, to hunt and so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Let's see what she does when she st stands up. Let's see how she's walking. Big stretch. Lions that are sick and very injured stay hidden in bushes. And she is a bit skinnier but she's not walking with a limp so her leg is not broken, her hip is not dislocated and her spine is not injured. So a flesh wound, she's going to have a nice story to tell about what has been going on? She's obviously got a bit of infection. I can see lymph nodes in her in her belly are a bit swollen. She looks a little bit. She looks a little bit uh, a bit. Michelle, you you thank you for the update. You're saying that the injury looks a bit better. It seems to have dried out a bit. Seems to just sit still. That is an unbelievable gash. That is amazing. Louise is telling me that it looks so much better as well, but that is a chunk of flesh. It almost looks like she's uh, she's had a piece of herself ripped out there, a pound of flesh. Oh. I don't know what it is about my car that has elicited this bowel voiding movement from everyone, I can tell you. I am very thankful the wind is blowing into my face and not sideways. Okay, so she's walking fine. She's skinny. It's a, it's a, it's from, it looks worse than it is, uh, to be honest with you. I've seen a few lion injuries that, that are quite obviously where the lions have actually broken bones and this is not the case. So bad, but superficial, thankfully. And if she can keep herself from too bad a septicemia, it, uh, it won't be too much of a problem either. Oh, there's another one of those little teddy bear cubs. Isn't that very cute? Oh, they are epic at this age, aren't they? This is the time of night when these ladies will start to hunt and um, they are hungry. I think testimony to the fact that we found the young males on the termite mound yesterday, I think it is absolutely the fact that these lioness are not starving but they're needing to cover some distance to kill something and with no buffalo around, opportunity to hunt what they need to hunt. So what are they going to hunt? They hunt zebra, wildebeest, kudu, young giraffe, buffalo, and they are around. Look at those lioness, strengthening the bonds that tie them together, the strongest bonds of all between sisters and mothers and cubs, rubbing their faces together, is, uh, passing the scent of the family around them. Now it is a bit dark because the sun has gone down and uh, we're not using any artificial light just yet. What we will do is switch on infrared light in a little bit. There we go. As infrared, isn't that just amazing? So with no artificial light and a light that these animals cannot see, we're able to increase your viewing pleasure.
all of them awake now, lying together and licking each other clean. It's called Allo Grooming. And these little cubs also just playing with each other. They, their teeth buds are itchy, hence the stick chewing. And it also helps to develop those very strong jaw muscles that will one day be able to clamp the air way shut of a large prey item, dispatching it quickly and quietly. Now I must say I agree with all of you out there that I hope they make a kill soon and I hope that that injured lioness gets some food and is able to repair herself. I mean if she's been walking around for two weeks with that injury and she's okay, she should be fine. It is going to take a bit of time to heal and I think it's going to leave a nasty scar. Now Control, you would like to know if the injured one would stay behind with the cubs while the others hunt. Uh, Control, there's a good chance that she does that. It's not impossible for, for, for that to happen. Um, there's also a good chance that her hunger will drive her on to be with her sisters. She might trail her sisters, not taking part of the hunt but walking with. And that'll be in an effort to make sure that when something does go down, she's got herself in a prime position. You can imagine with a bunch of hungry mouths like these 14 babies around, not much sticks around after they make a kill. And with no buffalo around at the moment, limited to things like kudu, wildebeest, on bushbuck and impala. And that is not going to go far with all these mouths to feed. That is for sure. They're in a prime hunting position though. Juma Dam is not too far away and this is a very good place for them. Dina, you'd like to know if other lionesses will help to gro groom and clean her wound? Yes, they absolutely will, will do. She'll take the lion's share uh, of cleaning, but they will come and groom her and keep the worst of the fly maggots and larvae and dead tissue away. Um, she might get a, you know, have a bit of an angry response to her, but, or to, to, you know, help, but they, she's in a good space. She's with her sisters and her cousins and her mom, potentially, if her mom's still alive and in this pride, and they all look after one another, and then all these cubs just can't help but lick one another. They just, it is, the absolute difference to the leopard we were viewing a little bit earlier. These are highly social contact species. Balrez, you'd like to know if the fur will grow back once the wound is healed. It all depends on on uh, what actual damage was there. Now, that to me looks bad enough that I don't think so. I think she's going to have a dark puckered scar there and I think that it's going to take some time to knit. There's, not, there's no flesh available to overlap and I think what we're going to see is a puckered, weeping, bleeding sore for a few, for a few, uh, a few months to come, possibly even as long as a year before this is fully healed. Uh, and it might never close. She might l keep it open uh, for a long time. It's going to be interesting to see how she makes her recovery. I doubt that she will die. Um, but septicemia... Now, proud cat mama, you want to know how rough a lion's tongue is? Is it rough like a domestic cat? Is it toothed? Yes, a uh, lion's tongue is very rough. Um, they have enameled teeth on their tongue and they are, no, it's not like a t tooth with a nerve for instance, it's a little projection but it is quite capable of stripping the skin off of your hand. If you ever look carefully on that line you might even be able to see the white projections on the tongue and so she's able to scrape off dead tissue and uh, and that is obviously where the septicemia will arise from. Oh, another big yawn there. No, not quite. This is a good place for them to be in, you know. They, they're about a mile away, half a mile away from Galago Pan. 
very thick section of bush and they've made many kills in here. Lots of kudu, lots of buffalo. You can see the lionesses are now listening. And Gallagher Pan and, Gall and Juma Dam holding some water, draw cards for animals all around. And the thick bush offering some protection and let's hold thumbs that this area delivers for them in the next couple of hours. And they can all have a decent meal tonight and a rest without having to walk too far. Beautiful sighting. I think these lions are going to get hunting quite soon. I think that these cubs will stay, stick around. Let's just see. Where they're deciding to walk now, there's virtually no way we can get a car through there without a helicopter blade. Let's just see what happens. You see the ticks on the neck? That is a sign of diminishing condition. When they start to get those big ticks on the side there, it means they're not spending as much time grooming each other as they should. And a tick-infested neck is a sure sign of lions that are battling a little bit. It's not uncommon though, so nobody panic. Um, 14 miles to feed between four and a half lioness is a difficult task. It's not easy, especially not in the Sabi sands. Now, oh, just look at that. Now from one set of lion cubs, why don't we send you all the way up to the Mara in Kenya where James has some lion cubs of his own. Yes, we do. Unfortunately, we had to disappear from them quickly to try and fix the light, which we've managed to do. But two lionesses have moved off. I don't know where they've gone. I can just sort of hear the other cubs. I now can't see anything with my naked eye. Has that cub gone off to the left there, Ferg? Or to the right? Oh, okay. I'm going to just shift slightly forward. If we do get a slight black screen, just stay with us, because we'll come back, I'm pretty sure, almost immediately. How's that? I'm just listening carefully and I don't know where those two lionesses have gone, if they've gone hunting or what's going on here. It's the danger of leaving them for more than five minutes, of course, they can disappear. I think the other cubs have gone into the rocks there. wondering about the coalition that fathered these cubs and how many lions there are in that coalition. I don't actually know. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are two, the black rock males. And I think there are just two males in that coalition, one of them quite badly damaged and old, and the other I'm not sure about. But you know, we're so far east here that we have not spent a huge amount of time in this part of the world. We will do more and more now that the migration has disappeared and uh, as we discover the wonders of this particular area. But I'm not actually sure about the black rock males, I'm afraid. Apparently he does come around here, the, the old boy with the missing eye and the sort of scuffed mane. By all accounts, nowhere near the Ryan Gosling of the lion world. Now, proud cat mama, you're wondering about what happens if the cubs come close to the vehicle. What will the lioness do? Uh, will she scold them? No, most likely she'll get cross with us. And that's uh, something that we need to be always constantly careful of, especially 
if you're on foot. Now, of course, Steph was tracking those lions that he's now found again in the vehicle on foot today. And your danger is if the cubs approach you, the lioness will take offense at you. And that, that can be, because the cubs can be extremely inquisitive and they can walk up out of their hidey hole and come towards you and then you need to extract very fast. Because what you don't want is a little thing like that approaching you on foot because mum will immediately assume that you are to blame, that you're uh, putting lollipops out or something in order to entice them. And she will come roaring out. And they say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, I've got to tell you, hell hath no fury like a lioness. Who Just trying to listen to see if I can hear the other lionesses. Is that other cub still there, Ferg? All gone inside the hidey hole. I think they've... yeah, it's gone inside, hasn't it? We might have to do a little loop around. I mean, we might mate with them for a little while. Maybe till the end of the show, and then we'll see if we can't find the other lions. And see if they aren't on the hunt. This little thing looks like it's thinking about having a stalk. It's looking towards where the others went. I can hear one calling now. Are the cubs calling? Yes, moving off. Maybe the lioness has got up onto the rock there and went behind, perhaps. Folks, shall I sneak slightly forward or wait here? What do you think? Let's go slightly forward, everyone. If you do go a little bit black screen, don't worry. It'll come back as soon as I stop moving. There they go. They're exactly back around to where the other lionesses were. They're probably in exactly the same place. I think this line has just moved away from them. Look how naughty. Getting so cross. All right, I'm not sure. I think we're going across to Juma now. I'm not sure how long we have to go until we get across there. Uh, but Steph's going to do you a last segment with the Nkuhuma Pride. And hopefully they too will be able to feed their little cubs. It's much easier for them, of course, because they've got cubs of such different ages. Oh, no, don't bite the head. That's a little bit rough. All right, we'll see you in a little while. All right, everyone. We have left the sighting of the Zunkuhumas, and it's getting a little bit dark. The, I think the adults were wanting to make a move off to go and hunt, and they need all the help that they can get. They don't need a big stinky car around and us talking around to make life even more difficult for them. So we've made our way out, as did Andrew, and we've now closed that particular sighting uh, for the rest of the evening until tomorrow. So no one else will be going through there at all. And this whole area will be left alone and for their own uh, hunting pleasure and I'm hoping they get some. There were some tracks of wildebeest on quarantine uh, this morning and I'm hoping that they'll listen and hear what's going on. There's also the good chance of some buffalo coming on to uh, coming to Juma Dam tonight. So for those who have access to the dam cam, keep your eyes open. Uh, I think you're going to be spoiled by um, some lions coming down to drink and little bundles of fur following them. I don't really have a plan for the rest of this evening. I think we'll see if we can find something by spotlight in the few minutes left. And all we can possibly do is find a bush baby for you, which is a good idea. So let me get my spotlight out, see if I can find it. There we go. And see if I can find a bush baby for you or something else interesting. I'd prefer to show you a golden brown baboon spider, but. A bush baby would do. 
been a pretty crack of a drive. I must be awesome. I mean, I must be honest with you. It's been jam-packed with a bunch of stuff. I mean, it was a stage that I didn't know what to look at between the leopard, the lion, the, I mean, the leopard, the elephant, and the and the uh, the monitor lizards. There was a lot on offer, and then I heard Omara was dishing out lion and cheetah and uh, and zebra kills. There's a scrub here. Eternal scrubby. So, so far, that's the life we're seeing. And while we're looking for our golden brown baboon spider, why don't we go and uh, chat? Well, why don't you go and have a chat to Brent about cheetah cubs? Well, welcome back, everyone. So, we're on our last night of our low light camera. You can see that giraffe disappearing into the distance. Now, very, very exciting. And I know the visuals of those cheetah cubs were, were not the greatest. But what it does mean for us is right on our doorstep, right next to home, is we've got a female cheetah and at least two cubs. There might be one or two more. And she is going to be there every day, up and down along the escarpment. So we're going to have lots of access, and this is very exciting. We can sort of compare it to being able to, there's a car just come past, and that's all the dust you're seeing. Compare to when we found Hosanna and Shongile, uh, right on our doorstep, which means we're going to have these cubs hopefully for the foreseeable future and hopefully that mom keeps them l really, really safe from all the potential horrors that live in the Mara if you're a cheetah. Now, of course, I cannot wait to uh, grow up with the cheetah cubs while we're in the Mara like we did with Hosanna and Shungile. So this is a very, very exciting time for us here in the Mara to be able to spend our time with those cheetah cubs and hopefully she has chosen good den sites and she'll be able to raise them to maturity so i'm not sure which female it is yet i have sent the photos through and hopefully we will get some id on that cheetah very very soon oh well, the giraffe is going to disappear into the forest uh, good morning first thing we'll be back in that area try get a positive id on the female and uh or maybe we'll get a slightly better glimpse of those cubs in tomorrow morning's early golden light. Now, the Mara is turning out to be a most spectacular part of the world for little cubs. So let, without further ado, let's send you back to James and the Black Rock Babies. Here they are, all many of them, and I must just say, before we enjoy the sighting in its entirety, I must confess, I think that the cheetah mother uh, of the two cubs that you've been looking at today is the same female we saw yesterday. I would find it highly unlikely if it wasn't. And I told you that I didn't think that she would have cubs because, you know, I thought she'd go back to them after she'd eaten. And clearly I was talking absolute garbage, and I do apologise for that. Um, I couldn't see any suckle marks, but I'm pretty sure that must be the same female, so I apologise. I didn't lie on purpose, I promise. Lionesses keep looking like they're going to get up and go and do something. One of them's wandered off. There she is, she just wants to be away from the cubs. And then they get up and then they kind of... Uh, uh, get down on the ground and the cubs are awake again after their very brief little nap that they had earlier. They're, of course, completely oblivious to the light that we're shining on them. And, of course, unlike the Sabi sand, uh, no one can close the sighting to us. So we have a ranger with us whose name is John. And John's sitting with us. And so we basically can leave them for as long as we'd like to, which is fantastic. Such lovely noises. Now, as you're wondering, I'm just going to listen for quickly. Such lovely noises. 
Snazzy, you're wondering why a lion would phlegm and grimace after licking one of the cubs. Well, it's, I suspect, because she's picked up a hormone, and it happened exactly after she uh, sort of cleaned up the back end of one of the cubs, and obviously there are hormones in that region, and pheromones, and so she would have interpreted those hormones and pheromones using her organ of Jap Jacobson, and I think it was probably just triggered by, you know, the kind of influx of hormones into the um, mouth, basically. But it is, it's an interesting one, because clearly there are hormones being produced by the male and female cubs, by their genitalia. Which is never a word you want to say too often, is it, Fergus? Mm -mm. <laughs> anyway, we've got very little time left with them. We are probably going to stay with them for the next little while. Um, we're obviously about to end the show now, and so if you'd like to catch up with us or keep watching, uh, I, we'll probably sit with them until the cubs go away and then we'll make a decision. But you'll find us on Facebook, of course, or and on Periscope. Are we going to Periscope ever? I'm not sure. On some whatever social media platform you are subscribed to us on, you can watch us there if the action happens. All remains, all that remains for me now is to say thank you very much for joining us. Big thank you to Fergus. Well done, Fergus. Good job. And uh, to all of you for your questions and comments. We will see you tomorrow morning, uh, Central African time, uh, 0530, I think. Bye-bye. Thank <music> you.